Council, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Kroll. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Council Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Present. Council Pelmucci. Council Phelan. Present. President Liang. Present. Seven members, you have a quorum. Thank you. If you can all stand and join me for a moment of silence to honor all the women and men serving here and abroad. <clears throat> If you're in the face of flag for the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Madam Clerk, can you open me the open meeting law, please? Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged impermissible. Thank you. Now, we do have quite a hefty agenda this evening with a number of presentations um, that I want to allow time for. So with that, uh, with the consent of the body, I'd like to move agenda nine, item number nine and 10 to the top of the agenda, if we could just review and move on that. So um, all those in favor with moving agenda nine and 10 out of order to the top? Any opposed? Okay, Madam Clerk, if you can start with number nine, please. Yes. 2020-039, a gift for $1,000 from the Quincy Credit Union for DARE. Motion to approve and motion, letter, thank you. Motion to approve by Councilor McCarthy. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Phelan. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Seven members. Thank you. You can go to number 10, please. Yes. 2020-040, a gift for $250 from Cindy Hall for DIA. Thank you. Motion to approve and send a letter of thank you. Motion to approve by Council McCarthy. Do we have a second? Second by Council DeBonin. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Pelmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Eight members. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to my colleagues for that. Now we'll go ahead and move up right along to agenda item number one, please. <clears throat> number one. 2020-033, an appropriation for $817,961 for MWRA Infiltration and Inflow Reduction Program Phase 11 Allocation. Thank you. Council McCarthy? Uh, motion to move that item into finance. President. Okay, so we have a motion to move this into finance. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so we'll move that into finance. Agenda item number two. 2020-034, an appropriation for $4,330,000 for MWR Infiltration and Inflow Reduction Program, Phase 12. Thank you. Council McCarthy? Motion also to move it to finance. Okay, so we have a motion to move this to Thank finance. You. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, so we'll move that into finance as well. Number three, please. 2020-035, land easement for 52 through 64 Warren Ave and 118 O Colony Ave. Councilor Valen. Madam President, um, I'd like to, uh, this is this is a, a land easement on a, on a project that goes back several years and I'd like to ask uh, uh, Janet from the uh, city solicitor's office to come up and explain the item. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Janet Petkin from the City Solicitor's Office. Uh, in the audience tonight is uh, Attorney Gareth Osmond, who represents the developers in this matter, and he, he has agreed to make himself available if anyone has uh, more specific questions. But um, this matter is before you tonight as a result of a judgment from the Norfolk Superior Court 
in regard to a development that's been proposed for the corner of uh, Warren and Old Colony Ave in Wollaston. Uh, this matter uh, is a 40B project. Uh, in March of 2017, the developers applied for a comprehensive permit pursuant to uh, Chapter 40B. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals denied uh, the application in June of 2017, and uh, Warren Place thereafter appealed to the Housing Appeals Committee. Uh, the city did file a motion to dismiss the appeal. However, that was denied, and in August of 2018, the Housing Appeals Committee decided uh, in favor of the developer. Uh, thereafter, a neighbor on Old Colony Ave appealed to Norfolk Superior Court, and ultimately in October of 2019, uh, judgment in Norfolk Superior Court was entered affirming the Housing Appeals Committee decision. That becomes what is known as the comprehensive permit, which allows the project to go forward. And uh, this actually goes back uh, for a few years prior to 2017. Uh, it was before the um, zoning board in a different iteration. And at that time, there were various studies done. They were done over the years regarding some easements uh, that needed to essentially be exchanged for this prop project to go forward, so that is what is before you this evening. It's, it's not really something uh, that can be up for much debate. It is a judgment from the Norfolk Superior Court that this project go forward, and all of the appeals period have now passed. Uh, if anyone has more specific questions, I'd be happy to turn it over to Attorney Orsman. But Otherwise, that is uh, the basis for this order before you. Thank you, Janet. Um, I'll throw it to my colleagues to see if they have any questions. Um, basically, I've, I've met with some of the people down there, and obviously there is a decision by, by the Superior Court on this. And um, not much we can do on it. Um, so basically, I would, uh, I would move, the, move approval on the easement. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Kane. Councilor Harris, did you have a question? No, no. Oh, you're just in a second. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions on this before we move? Councilor Pamela Chief? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Janet. Uh, can you just explain to me, so I understand the process that the project's gone through, but can you, understand, can you explain to me why we, would, why we have to accept the easement? What's the, what's the relationship of the easement to the project in general, if um, you know? When the Department of Public Works reviewed the matter initially, it was determined that two easements that were there were, would not be sufficient. So this is essentially getting rid of two easements to create one larger easement that will accommodate the project. So these are uh, utility and drainage easements? I, yes. Yes, and it's the opinion of uh, the engineering department at the time is that uh, despite some concerns raised that this would uh, have a negative impact on the city's infrastructure, that it's now actually designed to increase capacity in the whole neighborhood that would improve things there. So it's, it, they're, they're easements that will accommodate the recommendations of the engineering department. And what's the percentage of affordable housing? Oh, it's going to be workforce housing. I don't have those numbers with me. I think I will, if you don't mind, I would sure. have Attorney Ors Orsman to address that specifically. I don't recall the exact numbers. Now that you've found us, you're just going to keep coming back? Is that what's going on I'm here? afraid so. All right. This actually my involvement in this one, as you can see, dates from right. the last one. Um, this project actually was approved by both the Board of Appeals and the Planning Board in 2015. I'm sorry, do you mind just lifting the microphone up a little bit? Thank sorry. you so much. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. This project actually was approved by both the Board of Appeals and the Planning Board in 2015. The um, turn to 40B had a lot to do with, with 
appeals filed by neighbors afterwards and, and those appeals just rendering it uneconomic. Um, so when it was approved in 2015, uh, and both the city and the developer were on the same page. They talked about exchanging this easement. And there are two uh, storm drain easements from the 1930s when the city first laid out storm, a storm system in this neighborhood. Uh, and the property is currently developed with um, two four family houses that are pretty old. And the whole drainage system is not up to not up to today's standards. So uh, in place of these two 10 foot wide 1930s storm drain easements, we are granting two 20 foot wide, um, actually it's, well, it's a single one, but it's significantly more area to the city um, to build an up to standard uh, storm drain uh, so that basically drainage will be better on the site after the development. As far as the uh, affordable housing component, um, we still don't know which subsidy program we're going to go under. It was initially a pro, uh, uh, proposed as workforce housing, which would have meant all of the units were restricted. Unfortunately, the appeals um, closed the uh, ability to get that particular subsidy. So Because the funding ran out at the state level? So Yeah, it's got to go through the state. Any 40B project needs a state subsidy. So guaranteed at a minimum at least a quarter of these units including one of the three bedroom units will be affordable housing, meaning permanently deed restricted for at least 80% of the area median income. The rest will have to see what subsidy program we actually get awarded. So um, just that last part, the rest would see 25% are affordable at, you said 80%? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's 30 year deed restriction? Uh, I believe they will be permanent. I don't think okay. people do for 30 years anymore. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then the other 75, will those be market rate? Those will be market rate, although I don't, I haven't actually seen uh, pro forma, but I don't think the, um, this isn't luxury housing. It's, it's meant to be workforce level housing as it was mm. initially proposed. So I imagine those will be relatively affordable too. All right. If, and if you'll indulge me, there's just one more question. I'll vote for this obviously because we, it seems like we have to. It seems like it improves uh, the drainage of the, I actually the area. I would but love to talk. I know you have a, a whole agenda, but I came up here. And yeah, well, I know there, you get paid so. by the hour, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask you one more question, Counselor. Um, uh, the, and this is really just to better my understanding of the affordable housing um, development in the Commonwealth. The, so you, you're, you can still qualify as a 40B even though you're only at 80% of the – Median? Yeah, the minimum requirements by the 40B statute, which dates back to the 1970s, um, are you have to do at least a quarter of your housing right. at 80% of the area median. Okay. You can get um, other subsidies that maybe more give you participation a more money to from lower government it to if you go 40, lower. 50, right. Whatever. right. If you go to 50%, yeah. Yeah. there's other federal funds, things like that. But so for 40B, it's 80%, 25%. Right. Okay. So, so all I can say is we're still talking to the um, state agencies about how we're going to fund this, and that's going to determine the affordability. So that may change. The, yeah. Okay. Depending like said, on what it, you It can. was proposed. Workforce housing means everything's restricted to, uh, I think, around 100% of the area median income. Right. Um, and then you still have to have your, your uh, at least 80% or under. But... You know, this this unfortunately got tied up in appeals for two years. Um, yeah, from a and, policy uh, perspective, I get I get a little bit frustrated by eighty percent and a hundred percent because a hundred percent to me, a hundred percent of medium doesn't equal affordability. You know, a hundred percent affordable to the hundred at a hundred percent of the of the wages. You know, it's what sixty five thousand dollars. I think is the something like that. It's the median yeah. income for like a family of one. Um, so that what you actually pay at in housing costs on a salary of sixty five thousand dollars to me is unworkable, and so I, I from a policy perspective, I and we've had the same um, discussions about the affordable housing um, requirement that the city has because we don't have a cap as to the percentage of affordability to the median income. It's yeah. very similar to the state level. And we've had a lot of projects that have discussed 
um, workforce in terms of what they qualify as affordable. Um, all right, lastly, the, the way in which you went forward, this was not a, um, a mutual project with the city, right? This was not a friendly 40B, or would you qualify it as that? Because we appealed, right? Well, I, I, that's kind of a hard question to answer, just because, like I said, initially, it was almost the same project. Uh, it just wasn't done under 40B subsidy program, right. and the city approved it then. Right. And that's when all these details were worked out. So, so um, but, but for reasons, I wasn't in front of the Board of Appeals. I didn't represent this proponent in that uh, proceeding, but for whatever reason, when it came back as a 40B project, the Board of Appeals denied it. Right. So, so then it was more appealed. of a, then it was, it, it, you have to, in order for us to be subject to 40B, we have to ha be below the threshold of affordable housing, right? right? Uh, do you know what where we were at at the time that you filed your appeal or argued your appeal, whatever the, the relevant don't. time frame? Okay. I don't. Um, I believe the city is still under. It's, there are three thresholds. Right. Uh, two of them are unbelievably complicated. Um, We've been assured that we meet one of them, which clearly we didn't, and I suspect but, that was the basis of our appeal, which is the affordable. Yeah, housing and that's the most plan. that's the most complicated one to actually. That's a production plan, right? The affordable housing production plan. Uh, that's a land no. use area. Oh, is okay. that the only one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like there's, if, there's a formula. Sorry to interrupt. Just if I could, Councillor, um, we have Mr. Fatsis here from the planning department. I don't know if that's something that he would have information on. I know that we're referring back to 2015 to 2017, but. Uh, between Janet and, and Jim, if you would know. I know he would know. I was not bringing him involved. I'll ask him <laughs> later. The um, most okay. common one is that you need 10% of your uh, your total housing stock to be affordable. Right. And that's the one that usually people debate about. Uh, the city is supposedly, and I don't think it's been determined yet, but qualifies under the land use area minimum. Uh, I think they could only make that calculation after our appeal was filed, so that's why it didn't, didn't survive. Right. Yeah. Okay, good to know. Good to know the practice of the affordable. I mean, this is the other side that we we wouldn't have been a part of this if it wasn't for the easement that we're being able to accept that or that we're being asked to accept. This would have happened outside of this body's purview and other than Councillor um, Phelan, who uh, would be intimately involved, we wouldn't be. And, and I say in Ward 4, I, we haven't had any um, 40B projects, and it's kind of a rarity in the city of Quincy. We really don't right. get that many. So it's interesting to, for me to learn a little bit more about this process and see where, uh, you know, arguably we're vulnerable, right? And I say that because we're vulnerable to affordable housing going somewhere and a density going somewhere that we as a community may not agree with. Yeah. Whereas we should be striving to build affordable housing um, and dense housing in places that make sense, you know, closer to train stations and transit oriented districts. Um, so that we're not subject to it. So, all right. Well, thank you. I appreciate the indulgence, uh, Madam President. This is what happens when I'm not here for two meetings. I get all this pent up talking to do. So. No, we're excited to have you back. I've thank been you. doing affordable thank housing for a good 20 years, so I can tell you a lot about it from all, all aspects. It's a complicated problem, but it's an important one. One well, way or another, it's got to get built. I appreciate the information. Thank you, Council. Did, did anybody else have any other questions before we move forward? We do have a motion to approve with a second as well. Can I, can I interject one thing? Sorry. If I could just want to see if any of my colleagues have any other questions first, if that's okay. No? Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, there were two ordinances and they got split up. This one just deals with accepting the, the easement. The next council meeting, you actually have to deal with the ordinance that abandons the old easement. So I probably won't come back for that. But just so you know, it'll come back at the next council meeting. But it's all part of the same, same issue. Okay, so this is step one of two in this process then? Yeah. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, all right, so with that, if we have no other questions, uh, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane? Yes. Councilor Crow? Councilor DeBona? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Council Mahoney? Yes. Council McCarthy? Yes. Council Pelmucci? Yes. Council Phelan? Yes. President Liang? Yes. Eight members. Eight members with that passes. Um, next item, please, number four. 2020-036 in order of municipal aggregation. Thank you, and I believe at this agenda item we have a presentation, if we can have that first, um, and then I'll open up to my colleagues for questions. <clears throat>
Good evening, city councilors. Good evening, Shelley. Do you mind just moving the microphone down? Uh, is, Perfect. Is this better? Yes, thank okay, you so much. Great. Good evening. Um, we're, we're here to make a presentation about municipal aggregation. It's a, a program that you've talked about before and approved before, but we now have the plan in front of us and we have an update. So we wanted to provide everyone with the opportunity to review the plan and to hopefully approve it and give us permission to proceed with um, presenting it to the Department of Energy Resources, which is the next step. I'm going to give a, a brief um, introduction about the highlights of the plan and then introduce folks from Good Energy who are here, who are our consultants who are working with us on this. Um, I can speak endlessly on this, but I've been told to keep my remarks short, so I'll try to do that. Um, just a quick reminder of the goals of doing municipal um, electricity aggregation. The first, is, and there are many of them, but the first is um, for um, long-term price stability. Right now, folks who buy electricity um, and use nat National Grid as their provider have rating rate changes every six months on their bill. There's a winter rate and a summer rate. Right now, for example, the rate is almost 14 cents per kilowatt hour for residential customers. Um, six months ago, it was about 10 cents or, or 11 cents or so. So this will help um, folks with budgeting. The other issue is we, we expect to get competitive pricing for what um, National Grid provides for um, electricity supply. And the third um, goal, which is the one that's most near and dear to my heart, is that we expect to get more renewable energy in the mix. The amount of the minimum amount of renewable energy that is um, provided to um, is mandated by the Department of Public Utilities. We expect to uh, require a higher amount of renewable energy than is required. That supports the creation of new large-scale renewable energy projects, and that will help us address our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then the fourth significant goal is, is consumer protection. There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of um, issues in, in Quincy about residents um, being, I don't want, scammed may be the too strong a word, but, but signing uh, contracts with individual suppliers where there are sometimes hidden costs or where there are penalties for opting out. And our plan requires that there be no penalties for opting out and no hidden costs and no discounted um, costs in the beginning. So we want to, um, we want to really emphasize that. This is really a protection for the consumers um, in Quincy. Based on our recent, on recent experiences in other communities, we expect to be able to offer about 10% more renewable energy in the mix than is mandated by the state. Market conditions will vary at the time, so um, that's not an absolute firm uh, percentage higher, but that's what our goal is, and that's something that we feel is, is very reasonable to expect. And we will also offer the ability for any customer to, first of all, never sign up in the beginning, or to opt up um, to either 50% uh, higher 50% uh, of renewable energy supply or 100% renewable energy supply, as well as to opt down to the state's mandated uh, renewable energy percentage. The third part of the plan that I really want to emphasize is that we expect there to be extensive public outreach to ensure that residents and businesses understand the program and understand their options. So there will be flyers and notifications that are that are distributed throughout the city that will be translated into multiple languages. We expect to have a website and a media campaign with articles and interviews and flyers and social media postings about the program. Um, we are willing to do meetings in each of the wards if city councilors want there to be meetings. And we expect to do meetings for, for targeted groups such as uh, uh, Quincy Asian Resources, such as Quincy um, uh, QCAP, um, such as in, in the senior centers, 
with QCAN, with the Chamber of Commerce, with a, with a whole bunch of community groups. And um, we also expect to share the information that, about the program, both with the Quincy Police Department and with the city's constituent services department, because we know that there can be a lot of confusion about how to distinguish our program from other suppliers' programs. Um, with that, let me turn over the um, rest of, of the time to folks from um, Good Energy, and let me do some introductions. This is John O'Rourke, and this is Philip Carr, and I know he's here. Here's Patrick, Patrick Roach as well. Thank you. And, um, I'm, and Larry Cretion from Mass Consumers Energy. What's the last? Green, sorry, Green Energy Consumers Alliance um, will be, will be uh, making a presentation as well. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. <laughs> this is your Thanks a lot. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam President, members of the Council. Thank you very much uh, for having us here tonight um, and for your time. So, uh, so we'll move through this fairly quickly. Uh, our, so this is an exciting moment. Uh, we have your plan. Um, and we're ready to send this through to the Department of Energy Resources. Um, and they will, uh, essentially the purpose of that is it, 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 they will con provide a, a consultation if, you have any, if they have any questions on the plan or advice on the plan. And then, and then once you uh, have a consultation with, with the department, then we can submit it to the, um, the DPU, the public utilities. Uh, quick overview. So, so we're not we're not at the front of the queue here on 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 aggregation. There are a lot of communities that have done this before you, and that's not a bad thing, right? It means that really a lot of uh, the protocols, the practices, uh, the procedures have already been established. Um, so there are 150 uh, uh, municipalities that do now have aggregation. Um, uh, nationally, we are we're Good Energy is a national leader. Um, We've done this uh, an enormous amount. Uh, I personally work, have worked on about 220 aggregation plans in a couple of different states. So um, we have a really good understanding about, about, uh, about aggregation, how to help you meet your goals. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon here um, uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, and it's really spreading outside the Commonwealth now, um, also to Rhode Island and New Hampshire. But you can see for, for many years, although the aggregation law was on the books prior to the year 2000, it's really only since sort of 2014, 15, that communities really started moving forward with this. Um, and, uh, you know, the reality is that one of the uh, core benefits really is that element of budget stability. You know, when you have rates um, going up to 15 cents and down to nine, uh, it, it can be very difficult to, to plan for that. And uh, as one of, the, one of the sort of broader contexts here um, uh, above and beyond the individual benefits is that volatility of electricity rates is here to stay um, because as we, as we try and move to a lower carbon um, uh, economy, um, there, there, are, there are many exciting challenges uh, of how to, how to ensure rate stability, but certainly uh, aggregation is probably the best way you can actually bring some element of rate control down to the local government level. And, and it's a huge step forward and it's a very exciting way to uh, provide consumer protections for, for the people and also to increase the amount of local renewable energy. And, and um, so I think Shelley did a great job of outlining the benefits here. Uh, as we said, you're going to get more choice. Think about it. If you're out by yourself trying to get, an, trying to get a, a deal on an electric rate, it's fine if you're a large commercial enterprise, but they normally have an energy procurement manager. But if you're an individual house owner and you want to save some money, it's very hard to know what to do. And there's a lot of nefarious actors out there. There are some good actors, but it's hard to figure out who's who. Um, the great thing is, through this program, we're going to get that buying power together. And by buying together, we get that security. And also, um, you've done your due diligence on a consultant who knows what they're doing. Um, so we seek to provide lower electricity rates. I, I will say here that um, it's very important that these rates, uh, the, the success of the program financially is benchmarked over the term of the contract, right? So if you have a two or three year term contract, the goal is to provide savings over the term of the contract. Uh, and I must add this disclaimer that we, we, to date we have saved uh, all of our communities money on their aggregation programs. Um, but I, I would always say um, there are absolutely no guarantees that we will save money for your program. I have to say that. 
Um, or I'll tell you we have a couple of inherent advantages when compared to the utility. The utility has to buy uh, on, on, the same, on the same day twice a year. Um, we, we have the advantage that we can buy uh, when we want for as long as we want. And, 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 and that's, those are the key advantages. We're far more nimble. Um, so, so that's, I think, partly why we've been successful to date. Um, the, the, the local renewable option is very exciting. Um, uh, Larry Cretion uh, will we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and uh, yeah, the consumer protections. Uh, I know that Mayor Koch has played an important role there, uh, working with the Attorney General. Um, and as a gateway, gateway city, we've worked closely with other gateway cities um, on the South Coast who are also clients of ours, and we understand the challenges um, that, that you face to look after your residents. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Protest. So, yeah, over to you, John. Again, uh, let me emphasize that uh, one of our important goals here is to make sure that we have both economic and environmental uh, basis for our aggregations. We have teamed up with Green Energy Consumers Alliance, used to be known as Mass Energy Consumers Alliance, uh, and our strategic partnership, uh, we have developed models uh, and implemented uh, community aggregation models that have um, basically been rated by the Environmental Planning Workshop at Williams College for uh, number one among the uh, uh, Massachusetts aggregation consultants uh, for encouraging environmentally conscious municipal aggregations. Uh, that exclusively integrate Massachusetts Class I renewable energy certificates. The timeline uh, that you have followed, essentially uh, on April 23rd, 2018, the City Council unanimously passed an order. Uh, it was, it was uh, 2018-83 that authorized the mayor to research and develop a municipal aggregation plan. Uh, Chief of Staff uh, Chris Walker and Energy and S Sustainability Director uh, Shelley Dean led the effort to research municipal aggregation and conducted due diligence to select an aggregation consultant. In July of, the, of 2019, uh, Good Energy was selected by the city to provide municipal aggregation consulting services. The Good Energy team uh, with the guidance of Chris Walker and Shelley Dean, uh, has developed a municipal aggregation plan. Uh, Shelley did an outstanding job of letting you know what some of the uh, key points are here. Uh, the plan has been developed. Uh, public outreach and education is an extremely important part of the plan, making sure all the residents are informed, uh, and, and we do that very well. Uh, we're experts at procurement, and that's why we do so well in terms of the rates that we get for our clients. And then once the plan is in place, we have ongoing uh, management and monitoring of the plan. Again, Shelley did a great job of giving you the idea of uh, public outreach and education. We do multilingual in informational materials, newspaper advertising, uh, and interviews, local community TV access programming, uh, attendance at municipal meetings uh, and community meetings, attendance at public events, uh, including fairs and festivals, presentations to senior centers uh, and civic groups, development of dedicated uh, website and a link to the uh, city website, mailing campaigns, and water and sewer bill inserts. Uh, we will make every effort uh, to reach all of your residents um, of you know, any group in, in the city to make sure that they're informed as we move along in this approval process. As Shelley mentioned, uh, the standard product that we're looking to uh, put into the program that's in the plan is a 10% green energy over the Massachusetts Renewable Portfolio Standard. That's the RPS requirement which in 2020 is 16%. So essentially, this standard product would have 26% uh, green or renewable energy in the mix. 
Uh, there are three options in the plan so that everybody has an opportunity to participate. Uh, the basic option has the same amount of green energy as a national grid so that anybody who feels that that's enough, the 16%, can stay with the basic plan. There's also an opt-up to 50% and an opt-up to 100% for those who are very environmentally conscious and want to put more green energy into the mix. I'm going to turn it over now to Larry Cretion. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, Green Energy Consumers Alliance and how they provide the renewable energy. Uh, thank you, Councillors. Uh, Larry Cretion. I'm the Executive Director of the nonprofit Green Energy Consumers Alliance, but I also live at 166 uh, North Central Ave here in Quincy. Uh, so the slide up there now shows uh, what John just described. Uh, on the left-hand side is the fa uh, displays the fact that every uh, electricity supplier uh, in Massachusetts, National Grid or Eversource or a competitive power supplier, has a requirement called the Renewable Portfolio Standard. It goes up every year um, by 2%, um, and it, that there uh, in basically involves class one resources, which are wind and solar, anaerobic digestion, which is like cow power or uh, sewerage uh, to electricity, um, small hydro, um, and unfortunately that isn't sufficient to meet the needs of, of reducing carbon emissions by what we need in order to save the planet. And so we can go further than that. Um, and with this aggregation that Good Energy will organize uh, for the city, um, they will choose an electricity supplier who will provide the electricity to Quincy residents and businesses, but also make sure that it complies with the state law. Where we come in as an organization is uh, we buy renewable energy ourselves wholesale from generators that you've seen before. Uh, the two wind turbines in Hull, for example, uh, turbine in Situate, uh, Plymouth, uh, uh, Chicopee, landfill gas, uh, hydro facilities in Massachusetts. Um, about 90% of the power that we buy is from Massachusetts, uh, from facilities that you can go visit. Um, and we'll offer, uh, right now the plan is to offer 10% more renewable energy than required by law. Now, 10% may not sound like a lot, but as, as John said, the standard is, um, it's actually at 20%. Um, so it's a, if you do the math, it's, we're adding 10 to 20, so it's a 50% increase overnight, um, which is a substantial increase in what uh, we get into our electricity grid. Um, and because of the good work that Good Energy can do, they can get a better price for the electricity through smart procurement. Uh, the amount that they'll save on that procurement the track record shows has been high enough in, uh, that it'll pay for essentially the, the added cost of adding some renewable energy to the grid. So when you net it out, uh, the track record has been that uh, the savings have been there even going to 10% more renewable energy. They can't guarantee that, but that's been uh, the case so far. Um, we can also offer consumers uh, uh, two other options where they can, what we call opt up. Um, they can choose to pay a little bit more um, and they can get 50% more renewable energy than required by law, or they could go all the way to 100%. And as uh, Shelley indicated, people can actually even uh, opt down. If they don't want uh, anything except what the state al allows, they can do that. The difference between uh, the, the two items on the left, the basic and the 10%, uh, is, is probably about $20 per year. Um, and... Uh, so a lot of what we find is that most people will not opt out uh, or opt down, and then a few people will opt up if given the, given the choice. Um, and so real briefly, here's a, a schematic that kind of shows what everyone's doing in this situation. Uh, the city is in control. Uh, you're authorizing this. The mayor will decide whether or not to sign a contract with a, an electricity supplier. The electricity supplier will sign a contract with the city. Good energy, sort of the uh, the conductor in the orchestra here, making sure that this all works out. Um, the the uh, supplier will meet it, uh, buy enough electricity, renewable energy to meet the state standard. Uh, we're not going to help the supplier meet the state standard, but we will add the additional on top. And so we're sort of featured in the upper left of this schematic. Um, so we're looking forward to this. Um, you know, our mission at our organization is to help accelerate. Uh, a transition to a low carbon economy. And it's, 
there's a lot of ways of doing this. This is probably one of, one of the easiest ways to do it in a way that's equitable, uh, it's scalable, and uh, where it gives consumers uh, different options. And so we're looking forward to working with you all. All right, thank you. I will finish up here. So first, uh, my name is Patrick Roach with Good Energy, and I'll just talk about what the aggregation will feel like to typical uh, participant. So we will do an extensive public outreach campaign, as we talked about, and at the end of that process, all the eligible counts will be automatically enrolled in the aggregation program unless they have affirmatively chosen not to participate. Um, and that's uh, usually like sort of a six to eight week period that's where we're doing all that kind of outreach and giving people the chance to choose not to participate if they want. But then at any time during the program, customers can leave without any penalties or any fees. So even if they miss that window, they can come out at any time or change their option at any time. And then the nice thing is that um, customers continue to receive just one bill from National Grid. So the billing won't change, just the portion of the bill, that's the supply portion, will have a different name for the supplier, which is the winning supplier from our bid. Um, when there's outages or, or issues with the wires, National Grid is still gonna be the one to call and still gonna be the one to come and respond to those. So you know your reliability and quality of service is gonna remain exactly the same. And some of the great programs like budget billing and low-income discounts, net metering for solar, those will be unaffected as well. So those will all remain in place. Uh, as we talked about the regulatory next steps, the first, the first next step is to go to the Department of Energy Resources and get a consultation from them. That could take six to eight weeks, and the outcome of that is a consultation letter. And then once we have that, we can move on to the Department of Public Utilities, where that's a much longer process based on what other workload the DPU has in front of them. That can be six to nine months, where they'll be reviewing the plan and ultimately issuing an approval. Um, and so once we have that approval, then we're gonna be looking at the market conditions and seeing when would be a favorable time to go out to bid. Uh, so tonight we you know, are seeking a vote of the city council to submit the aggregation plan to the Department of Energy Resources and really get that um, regulatory process moving. Um, this is just a graph for reference of a number of our communities in a buying group in um, southeastern Massachusetts showing in orange the, the buying group's aggregation rate uh, over a couple different contracts compared to the national grid basic service rate for residential customers. So this is just highlighting the kind of volatility every six months that there is in the national grid rate uh, compared to the a much longer stable uh, pricing we're gonna get for each contract period, multi-year contract period. Um, and as you can see, not, in not every six month period are we beating the rate, but um, over the contract terms, we have a history of being able to, to beat the rate. Although, as we've said before, the, um, we cannot guarantee those savings. Uh, this is just an example of some of our municipalities who have uh, also chosen in their default rate to have more renewable energy than required by the state law. Um, these five communities um, have just recently finished up a two and a half year contract and the savings are shown there, but they, um, most of them had 5% extra renewable energy and uh, Brookline had actually 25% extra and over the course of that contract term, they were all able to save money compared to the basic service rate from the utilities. Um, ultimately, each uh, eligible account will be getting a letter uh, called an opt-out letter, which looks like this now. We're in the process of improving it to uh, make it a little easier to understand, but this is the, the letter that tells um, a, a resident or business that's eligible what the rates are of the program and how to opt out if they don't want to be in the program at all. So this will be get mailed to every, every uh, eligible account. And of course, ahead of that, we're gonna be doing lots of all those other public outreach uh, mechanisms we talked about so that when people get that opt-out letter, they know what, what it is and what to do with it. So we'll be doing all sorts of branded material, flyers and um, uh, other types of mailings and um, social media and in-person in events as well as, as were described. So these are some of those um, examples, just showing you what we've done in some other communities. Different languages here. 
and we'll have a program website, uh, which will, you know, everything's going to be city branded and it will be a place where, with uh, information about the program, frequently asked questions. It'll also allow people to change their rate or opt out of the program through a simple form on the web and have contact information for us for, uh, for questions. Um, and we've also done a lot of good work working with local cable access channels to do videos that run on cable access as well as being posted on, on the web. And uh, I think with that. Great, thank you. Um, if the four of you could just stay available for questions, I know. Um, I'm just gonna throw it first to Councillor Kane, who sponsored this uh, effort first a year ago. And uh, Councillor Kane. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I can't believe it's been almost two years since we first brought this to the council. This was uh, from April of 2018, but it was firstly in March of 2018, I sat with the folks at QCAN with David Reich and the, and the crew uh, to talk about this initiative, which I think is very smart. And I think it, uh, you know, this is really about consumer choice, uh, kind of as we're looking at some other options in the city right now, including to um, develop a municipal broadband. This is a similar, uh, similar but different initiative, of course, but uh, it's about providing options to our residents and uh, hopefully at a better cost at the end of the day. This particular initiative um, would hope to alleviate some of the burdens uh, that we face with electricity production. Um, and so um, I look forward to seeing this move forward. So thank you very much to the Good Energy team. Thanks to Larry Cretion uh, and uh, his team for being here. And thanks to QCAN folks. And, and nice to see a crowd of residents here tonight who I think are largely in support of this initiative. So um, I do want to, uh, one, send my support. And um, I'd move this forward for approval um, before there are any questions before my colleagues. Great. So we have a motion to approve by Councillor Kane, seconded by Councillor Phelan. Thank you. And I do, again, before we move forward, I just want to allow for questions. So, uh, Councilor Fain, if you could just hold that, Councilor Mahoney did have a question, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. Councilor Mahoney? Hi. I just want to thank you very much for the presentation. Um, this, is, this is something that I think, um, I think it's going to be great for the city of Quincy, because I know a lot of seniors get these phone calls on a regular basis. And, you know, it's really unfortunate when people are put in a position when they think they're going to exchange um, you know, one service for another to save money, only to find out that they've been locked into something and that they're, the very thing that they're trying to do to stay in their home is actually jeopardizing them. And there's nobody more vulnerable than our seniors when that happens. And I can attest to that, this happening. My parents are 90 and 92, and they get calls. I can't tell you how many, a thousand calls they get. And my dad's hard of hearing, so he can't answer the phone. And my mom has some memory issues. So it's really challenging. I mean, the one thing I will say is that she, she is, she's very good at saying no to something like that. Because she knows that if it's, if it's, if it's going to save her a dollar, she really doesn't trust that it's going to save her money. So I'm thankful for that. But, you know, for, for those families that don't have that protection or don't have that, that loophole, they, they, get into, they get themselves into some real serious issues because they're not saving. And this is something that, you know, as we move forward as a city, and we implement this, it's potentially gonna be something that they can say yes to, and if it's not saving them the money or if they're only getting a credit in their, in, in, in their green, energy, green energy consumption and they don't wanna do it and they wanna go back, they can. And that's the positive that comes from that. And not only that, but then it also moves us as a city into the right direction for our, you know, our being a green city and, and moving us up that ladder to be able to be positive about what we're doing in our environment. The one question I have, and I know there's a lot of things going on, so what's the implementation time from the time, like what are the next steps and what's the implementation time for something like this to go into effect? I know you have a lot of communication to do, the, do to everybody, but from start to finish, getting, getting the word out, when do you think that this might be available for people to, to actually utilize? I know it's someplace in this package, but I, I just wanted to. Councilor, on, on, on slide uh, 14. Yep. The next step is uh, for submission to Department of Energy Resources. Right. It'll be with them six to eight weeks. Okay. They'll do a consultation call uh, with your chief of staff, uh, letting him know that the plan conforms. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a 15, 20 minute call. From there, they give us a consultation letter. They give the city a consultation letter. It goes to the Department of Energy, uh, Department of Public Utilities. That can be six to nine months in the approval process. So right now, you're talking about uh, in, in, the, in the area of eight to 11 months mm -hmm. from, from the time we get it to DOER. Okay. Yeah, I might just, uh, that's right. Thanks, John. Yeah, I might just add one thing. So, uh, 
we uh, so yeah so then so then what happens is you get your you get your order approving approving the plan, and then we run a competitive bid. Um, since since we're all here, might as well tell you a bit about that now. So so you, you'll have the largest suppliers in the country bidding mm -hmm. on this. That's something. We, so and we and, and they're very strictly pre-qualified as well. So all these offers. Um, so there's basically only three or four suppliers. Um, three of them are sort of Fortune 200 companies that can do this kind of work. Right. So, so adds to that consumer protection element. And, uh, so, and if the market conditions are favorable, we will go out to bid. Nine times out of 10, that's straight after the approval. There are sometimes conditions where the market conditions are not favorable and, and we will advise to wait a bit. Okay. So that's the only caveat I would add to that. It's because you want to lock in with the best rates, and that's the yes, so exactly. you've got to check the market to see if that's if, where the vulnerabilities are to make sure that we're we're locking Quincy into the best rates that we can. Exactly. Okay. So so to John's point, uh, also with the DPU, it's um, it's hard to predict <laughs> how that's going to play out because <laughs> they they have a lot of they have a lot of different things to do, and it can be a question of 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 what what they're focusing on at any given time. But um, I would say between. Uh, yeah, sort of broadly between sort of eight and twelve months. Yeah, yeah. I certainly don't want to promise something too 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 early, but I just want to make sure that there's a realistic timeline. I know that this broke it out, but I also know that there's the next phase. So if you're thinking eight to twelve months, and they have to go out to a competitive bid. Let's just say that the market is just be positive and say the market yeah. is good. So once once you lock into that competitive bid, yep. then what would be the next step for the consumer, like the city of Quincy, be able to consume this, to be able to yeah, opt into good it? Good question. Right. So so say say let's say if every Let's say we uh, have a bid in, say, November for January start next year, mm -hmm. right? So, so that so that would be a, so that would be that would, you, that that would work. So what happens is, so you have a bid uh, within about ten days. The opt-out letters will hit everybody's mailboxes. Yep. Um, and then thirty three days, basically, um, uh, uh, to actually allow for people to respond whether they want to be in or out of the program. Um, if they do nothing, they'll be automatically enrolled. Um, and then you'll be enrolled on the next meter read cycle. So if you have your bid um, uh, sort of in sort of uh, November time, then you yeah you can get enrolled for January, February. I would like to think this program is live in February next year. Okay. Yep. So obviously we're going to have lots and lots of communications to the constituents of the city of Quincy way before this happens. But right. this gives kind of a timeline for if everything rolls on in a perfect world, yep. you know, we'll be ready for this potentially um, by November of 2020 or November, just to make sure. Yeah, exactly. So November 2020. Uh, with, for yeah. a January start date. So, so it wouldn't so actually start. Yeah, I would say Jan January 21 is, is, is a good figure to aim for. And, and with the marketing, generally we ramp it up about six, six weeks before. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've, we've discovered if you start too early, people get a little confused. So yeah, we'll, have no, absolutely. we'll have a coordinated campaign about six weeks before and, and six weeks after the date that the opt-out letters are dropped. Because really that's your D-Day, because then suddenly it's like, ding, you've yeah. got thousands of letters arriving in town. And, and our goal is to have a plan for... for and of course, that opt-out is kind of key because sometimes people don't see it, they don't realize it. But the good news is, should somebody not want to be in it exactly. and they didn't realize they had to opt out of it, there is a way out of this. It's not permanent. And I just want people to know that at home, just if they're hearing it, it's not, you know, we're not taking away any of their rights to make a yep. choice. We're providing them a right and an opportunity to right. participate in something separate than being locked That's into right. the monopoly that we're stuck in. And, and also... Um, helping them avoid the, 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 the shortfalls of, of the telemarketers that are out there trying to take advantage of them. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think this presentation was, um, it's, it's, I'm great that we're here tonight at this point. I'm very excited about this opportunity for the city of Quincy. I want to thank Mayor Koch for um, working so hard to make sure that we're getting this to um, be an opportunity for the city of Quincy and Councilor Kane for bringing it before us. And I look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mahoney. Councilor Fallon? Yes. Um, I get you through you, through you, uh, Madam President. To uh, I'm not sure who to ask the question to, but I know just a couple of years ago, myself included, lots of people put solar panels and providing clean in energy, and it's worked out great. I have some on my house. How would this affect people who had gone ahead and, you know, are producing clean energy? And um, I guess would would this affect the bill? Are they able to get in this, or? Um, Good question. Um, I, I also have solar on my home. <laughs> um, so, um, no, it, it won't affect your 
bill at all. I mean, what will happen is with solar, I don't know how much, um, how much you're producing, how much electricity you're producing, but whatever you continue to buy, whatever mm -hmm. you're not, whatever your electricity, whatever amount of electricity is not being produced by your solar panels would, would be affected by this program. Um, so if you continue to buy 50 kilowatt hours a month, um, mm -hmm. then you would um, be buying 50 kilowatt hours through this program. Um, there will be months where you'll be getting a credit. There may be months where you're getting a credit. I don't know if that's the case for you, where you're producing more electricity than you're currently using. Um, and th that will also go through this, this program. But it, it, but overall, it, it won't if, if affect so, you. So it basically won't affect anything. I still get an electric bill from National Grid, and it, it won't exactly. be affecting anything. Exactly. The, okay. only, the only difference that you'll notice on your electric bill, and you may or may not notice it, depending on how um, careful you are about reading your bill, is that um, the second part of your bill, which is the supply section, there will be a different supplier listed, depending on which supplier wins the competitive mm -hmm. bid, and the rate will be different, because the rate will be wh whichever rate um, gets, um, whatever the rate is that, that, that gets determined at that point. Well, thank you. I'm very much in favor of this, and it's really great to see Council Accretion. Uh, it's almost a flashback to the 80s, seeing him there when I used to, <laughs> used to serve with him. There was a TV show on that back to the 80s. Well, I think this is a wonderful program, and I'm thrilled to be in a, I'm absolutely in support of it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Fairland. Do any other of my colleagues have any questions? Council Pamunchi? Just a couple of quick questions. I don't know. I'll just lob them out there, and you can all kind of whoever is appropriate. Um, first is, uh, can someone explain to me what a class one renewable energy certificate is? And then I'll follow up, it's yeah. part of your explanation. Can you explain how it, how it works in this system? Because we're not actually, well you explained it to me, but my understanding is are we not actually buying the energy, we're buying the certificates that somebody else about the right. energy, can you explain it? Uh, New England has a system uh, where they, they uh, um, track uh, all the production of all energy in the, in, in the six New England states and also anything that might come in from Canada or New York. And every one megawatt hour of generation, uh, if it's renewable energy, earns what's called the Renewable Energy Certificate. From and who? The idea is that we want to who does that come, Larry, who does that come from? They earn it from who? From the state, from the feds? Uh, so when a generator creates uh, one megawatt hour of electricity, it's going to be able to sell the electricity into the market. Someone's going to buy it. But it also has value. It has the. It can. It's, it's on a computer, but pic, picture it as a piece of paper that says I've earned a, a credit, a certificate, and I can sell that separately from the electricity. And be, and so it's what it's what it's used for is a tracking method. Some people don't want to buy the renewable energy. Some people do, and so they're able to. And the state has a program called the Renewable Portfolio Standard. So um, the anyone selling electricity has to buy a certain number of certificates to prove that they're helping to put more renewable energy onto the grid. And so it's meant to be add some fungibility to, to the electricity system. And so National Grid and Eversource have to buy these certificates. So does the supplier that's gonna ultimately meet uh, the needs of, of Quincy. And so what we're, when, when you want to claim that you're buying renewable energy from a wind power turbine or a solar panel or something like that, you're, you need to buy the certificate. If you don't buy the certificate, um, then you can't claim that. So uh, what we're doing here is by buying more certificates in order to, to meet the goals of this program, someone has to produce it out there in, in, in New England. And so it, it, it's a demand pull onto the system. And uh, so there's no double counting. If, 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 if Quincy buys a certificate from the wind turbines in Plymouth, somebody else can't. And so they've got to go find it somewhere else. And who oversees this program? It's state program or is it a federal program? So the, uh, the tracking system, the, the, the inventory is managed by uh, a group called the Independent, Independent System Operator of New England. It runs the whole power grid. Um, and then there's Massachusetts Department, Department of Energy Resources um, uh, administers the renewable portfolio standard that the uh, electricity suppliers have to report to and so what's gonna happen is what uh, the electricity suppliers are gonna have to prove to the state that they 
bought enough certificates to uh, meet the claims that they said that they did. And so, so there'll be some oversight there. Um, and is it, is it a free market? We're, we're, what's the basis of the value of the certificates? Exactly. It, it is a market-based system. So good point. So uh, every year the, the demand goes up according to the, state, to the state law, the renewable portfolio standard. So that creates, uh, in theory, a tighter market. But then, of course, you see the supply be, being built as a result of that. And so that's why we're seeing uh, solar panels on Council of Phelan's roof. That's why you're seeing um, the discussion about offshore wind. Um, and all these other projects that you're seeing uh, crop up is being met to primarily to meet the standard. But what we're trying to do with this program is to actually add to demand over and above the standard. But we're using the, the standard as our um, platform and we're using the market-based system uh, as, as the method for making this all happen. So, um, so essentially the system, you said the DPU escalates the requirement for production, therefore creating more of a demand. Right. The demand is created through the value of the certificates and the certificates get more valuable. There's a bigger incentive for, for more production right. to come into the supply, the supply and demand. So, but they're creating the demand through government regulation. Right. Uh, is there a, what's the limit of the certificates? Is there a, the potentiality that there wouldn't be enough certificates for municipalities to purchase? I mean, what's the, the spread versus um, what's available in the market and what the market demands? Yeah, uh, over the, this is a system been in place since 2003. There's always been enough certificates to meet the standard. Um, it gets a little tight sometimes if supply doesn't come on fast enough. But that's sort of the object of the game. We want to make sure that there's, the system gets tight enough to encourage pr production. But the production's pretty much kept place, uh, kept pace. And um, so we're, we have no doubt that it's a little bit like Field of Dreams, but the opposite, which is if you, uh, if you keep buying, there will be people who build. And if you buy it, they will build it. Yeah. Okay. Because there's value. That's right. Right, because the money's already there. We're trying to put our thumb on the scale a little bit with sort of the mantra I have at my organization is we want to pay a generator what they need to get built, but no more than that. Right. So we want to shop for anyone who's eligible who can put a certificate on the market, but we don't want to overpay them. And what's the um, lead time? So our, in terms of like from the supplier side, what's the lead time before they see that a municipality like Quincy or Brookline or Attleboro is coming online into this program? What's the, right? you know, like when do they see and know that we're going to be purchasing, therefore they can make business decisions relative to increasing supply? Uh, so the good news is that uh, as a, gra a graph was shown, showing the amount of communities that are doing aggregation, uh, it's beginning to send a pretty good uh, s signal to the marketplace. Um, but uh, honestly, the renewable portfolio standard is a much bigger uh, part of demand than the aggregation is now. And that's I, a standard set by the government. The standard set by the government. So there are a lot of generators right now who are thinking all the time about, I got to build so that I can at least sell into the, the market that that standard's talking about. But now this aggregation's becoming uh, more serious and more important. Um, what our organization does is we, uh, we're talking to another, a number of generators right now who have projects on the drawing boards and you know, quite frankly, we're taking some risk. We're, we want to enter into a what's called a forward contract. We, we, we think that the demand for renewable energy is going to be strong in Massachusetts uh, forever. And, but so we're looking to sign contracts with folks who have, um, who are planning projects. And, uh, and so we, we look to the idea that communities will step up and that the standard will be there. So I guess that's kind of what I was asking relative to the, to the communities like Quincy, you know, in the lead time. So, uh, so when we come into the system, we're buying existing certificates and someone else is just making a long-term play that from the supplier side, a long-term play that, that the, the demand's going to continue to escalate and they'll, they'll be able to make money. If you, if you were to start, if this program was to start on January 1st, 2021, uh, it's probably from a project that's run, running today. Right. Uh, but what I call it is playing keep away. If, if, you're, if Quincy's going to buy it, then uh, National Grid's got to go work harder uh, to go find certificates. But what we'll be doing is uh, maybe within a year or two, we'll end up bringing another new project online that would be... Uh, It'll feed some other municipality or in, 10 years in, in, in Quincy. Quincy, what we deliver to Quincy could change over a period of years. 
right. well, the, uh, think of it as a big soup. Yeah. The, and the standard increases that you're saying, which will continue to drive demand, um, those standards you said were set by the government, and the standards are the government telling the energy company, like National Grid, that they have to buy X amount, and that goes up. So that creates the demand. If there was zero demand, arguably, right, it's zero demand, National Grid just has to pay for the renewable energy because that's what the government says there has to be a minimum amount of. Uh, the, if Quincy didn't do aggregation. Say, say nobody wanted green energy. Everyone, yeah, nobody yeah. wanted it. The, the, National Grid still has to buy it. That's right, even right. by mandate, absolutely. I like this program even better because it sticks it to National Grid. It's like, how can you make the program better? Oh, we stick it to National Grid. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah. Um, all right, and then, so my, other, my, my last question is, in this whole soup, if you will, um, obviously, companies like yours, all of yours, you're, there's some way in which you are funded, right? Some way in which there's money. So where does that come from? Does that come from the cost of the electricity to the, like the resident, the end user, or is it somehow built into the system of the trading of the certificates? Uh, the certificate cost will be a small portion of the, uh, the supply rate. So um, good energy is gonna go out and competitively procure an electricity supplier that if it was today, they'd probably end up charging 10 or 11 cents, I believe, per kilowatt hour in that ballpark. And, and that's where the, most of the dollars are gonna go. They're gonna flow. Um, National Grid will do the billing, the metering and the billing. But when you write your check for electricity supply, they'll remit payment to right. Acme Electricity Company. So it's in the spread between the supplier and the, and the end user. Correct. Is where the groups like you guys will be able to. Correct. Okay. So we don't, do we sign a contract with any of you guys? Just saying that you are going to be the supplier. Right, so it's not even a contract where the city pays you necessarily, or how does that work? So uh, there actually will be two contracts where we sign a contract with Good Energy for their um, consulting services, mm -hmm. and then when we go out to bid, we will sign a contract with the actual supplier. Not them. No, they're not a supplier. They're, okay. they're going to go out to a bunch of national companies, um, and, and we will select one. Actually, the mayor will select one, right. and, um, and then we will sign a contract with them. And that contract is only for the supply of energy. We don't pay for that. It, it's a pass-through. The city isn't paying for that. It's a pass-through where we say you get to sell to the residents exactly. of the city. Exactly. The contract with the supplier, um, the city itself won't pay anything on that contract, um, but it basically gives the supplier the ability to sell electricity to residents right. and to and to small businesses. And then good energy only becomes involved in the process. I mean, they guided us through this, but they, they connect us with the supplier that they think is best for the city. Uh, and then they go away until we renegotiate that or? No, uh, good energy's role, uh, first of all, it has already started, but right, right. right. Um, but good energy will um, uh, part of the reason why I ask, because I noticed they started in July, and I don't ever remember voting for anything that paid them. That was part of the, what spurred the, the question. And so I was, if I didn't vote to pay them, I, I always like to know how people are getting paid, you know? Sure. sure. It's like Facebook. Um, if you, so you good know, energy's the service role. is free, then you're the, <laughs> you know, you're the, you're the Good meat. energy's role will be to, to, um, uh, uh, to develop the, the auction itself, to advise us on the auction, to help us with the contracting once we select a supplier, then to manage the um, process where um, consumers have the ability to opt in and opt out. And quite frankly, every month there are new consumers who move into Quincy and consumers who move out of Quincy or residents who move in yeah. and businesses that move in. And we call um, them voters. They, yeah. What? Sometimes voters, we voters call them voters and then we say, oh, right, <laughs> residents. Yeah. Yeah. You can call them consumers. And, and roughly every quarter, um, Good Energy will reach out to, to new folks to say, now you have the ability to, to opt into our program. So they will be um, involved in the program for however long the contract with the supplier is. Okay. And so you said there were two pieces to their work. That's one of the pieces. And you guys get paid for that through the the supply of the energy in some sort of, um, what do you call it? Like ar arbitrage almost like, right, okay. And then what would be the other involvement? 
Would it be the oversight or is, does that cover everything? That covers everything. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for all that information. It's very exciting. Um, you know, obviously supported it in 2018. I think um, city's done a wonderful job. I, I commend the mayor for it and Councilor Kane for bringing it forward um, in 2018. So it's great. It's exciting. Look forward to seeing what you guys do. Thank you, Council Member Chief. So we have a motion to approve by Councilor Kane, seconded by Councilor Phelan. Um, does anybody else have any other questions before we before we move on this? Great. Um, I, before we take a roll call, I just want to, uh, Shelley, call you out specifically because uh, my education on this, specifically with the outreach, um, it was a conversation you and I had one-on-one, -on -one, and I know that the outreach is going to be, um, you know, challenging. I think, so, you know, the education piece of it and then also making sure that we make that one-on-one -on -one connection with all the residents across the city um, with the many different languages that are here is an effort that you are already getting ahead of, and so I really appreciate that. And I do just want to offer the support of all of my colleagues. I know that everyone up here is very excited to share this with our constituents as well. And so we are all here um, for your disposal for any support or services that you need during the outreach efforts before, during, and afterwards. That's terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, for everything. Um, so Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor King. Yes. Councilor Kroll. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Eight members. Eight members, it passes. Thank you. Thank you for your support today. <laughs> Madam Clerk, next item on the agenda. Number five, 2020-014, an ordinance amending municipal code title five, 5.40.090, used car dealers, motor to license. Thank you. Councilor Palmucci. Yes, uh, if I may, this, um, all right, so this was, this is getting back into um, the Motor 2 licenses, uh, an ordinance that we passed in the last session. Uh, we have been implementing it for what, about a year? It's existed for about a year. Uh, and working with the clerk's office and some of my fellow counselors, including uh, my esteemed colleague from Ward 6, uh, we realized that I wouldn't call it a loophole, but a, uh, a significant oversight in our ability to um, provide oversight, different definition of the word oversight, um, exists. This, this amendment seeks to change that. And I'll, I'll just say what, what it was. This was the overall legislation that we passed last year said that um, rather than this kind of willy-nilly system where some some motor vehicle license two holders had a set number of vehicles that they could sell or repair on their property. Some didn't have any, some had numbers that didn't seem to have any rational relation to the property that they were operating on. Um, so we set a standard that you either get two, uh, one car per 200 or one car per 300 square feet. Uh, and we excluded building. What we didn't do and what we've realized is, a, is an issue um, is we didn't, we didn't allow for the licensing board to say, well, you have, you know, 100,000 old rubber tires on your property. And if you can, you know, if your license says you can hold 100 cars, but, you know, you literally only have one parking spot because you have so many rubber tires, the licensing board would have to give you that license for 100 cars. They couldn't look at the site and say, clearly you cannot fit a hundred cars, so we're going to lower it. Um, that's what this does: is it, it allows some flexibility to the licensing board to amend um, down administratively the number of cars that you can get on the site. Another issue, um, and the one particularly in Ward Six, was that there's a, there was a, 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 a property, a business that um, has received blight ordinance, uh, blight tickets, uh, and hasn't. They have some storage issues with other materials and. Um, they clearly can't safely fit the number of cars which our existing ordinance would allow. So this creates a mechanism by which the licensing board can administratively reduce the number of cars that a, um, a Motor 2 license holder can have on their property and then also sets up uh, a process by which if the Motor 2 license holder disagrees, they can appeal that uh, before the full license licensing board for a hearing. And that way you know, folks will have due process. They can have their... Um, they can have their um, hearing before the licensing board if they disagree with the administrative de determination. This has been advertised, I understand. We were trying to close this uh, 
again, I don't want to call it a loophole, but we we're trying to close this um, gap in the ordinance relatively quickly. Um, so I was looking to um, have this passed tonight. If any of my colleagues have any questions, I I'd be happy to answer them. I'm sure the city clerk would be happy to answer them as well. Uh, but I would move uh, uh, passage of the ordinance, move approval of the ordinance. All right, so we have a motion to approve by Councilor Pamucci, and if it's okay, I'd actually like to second it. Um, I have a dealership around the corner from my house who um, I think has slowly started to clean up because of the work you've done around this, and uh, they're not quite there yet, but that's just one of many that we have across the city, and so, uh, you know, all the steps that you, in, you know, in, in conjunction with the, the clerk's office, um, it is having a positive impact on the neighborhood, so I would be glad to second this, um, but want to open it up to my colleagues for any questions before we move forward. Uh, Councilor Harris. Thank you. Uh, I just want to commend, thank you, um, Council Pomochi, as you have, uh, uh, as you mentioned, yep, I'm, we're dealing with a few places in Ward 6 that, um, um, quite frankly, uh, aren't good neighbors. And when you're not a good neighbor, you know, bring it to them. And this allows us to bring it to them. So, I, again, thank you. And um, I hope my colleagues uh, support us with this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. I just want to thank Council Palmucci as well. For your time and um, listening and hearing the um, license board's concerns about um, the motor two, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If you can go ahead and call the roll, please. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Crow. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Pelmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Eight members. All right. Item passes. Next item, please. Next item is number six, ordinance amending title two, administration and personnel chapter 2.148. Okay, we're gonna waive the reading, Council Mahoney. Thank you very much. Um, so this is just, a, it's an ordinance that I wanna put into ordinance tonight. It's about advertising employment and vacancies on our quinzymass.gov website. Um, it came to me, I, I took a look at our, uh, you know, the top 10 largest cities in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and they all advertise and post their employee, employment and vacancies. Um, and I noticed that Quincy, we're, we're the eighth largest city in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we do not. So I, I do think it, the, the city of Quincy has grown tremendously, and it's an opportunity for the city of Quincy also to open up transparency of those open positions and to ensure that the most qualified candidates are now being able to, um, to apply for municipal opportunities. This came to my um, attention when some, a resident got in touch with me um, with incredible credentials and was hoping to find out about open positions in the city of Quincy, and there's really no way to do that. Um, and and it, she could be a valuable asset to the city of Quincy um, if there was a position that was, was good for her to be able to come and work here. So um, we're gonna put this into, the hope that this will go into ordinance and we'll take a look at it and try to put into section 2.148.060 for advertising employments and vacancies and just start a dialogue really about how we can move um, the city of Quincy forward and um, with opportunities um, for residents to be more involved and to know what's, what, where their salaries and who's being hired in the city of Quincy. Great, thank you. So we have a motion to move this into ordinance. Any questions, Councilor Pamunji? I would, um, I would second this and um, I thank Council Mahoney for bringing this forward. Happy to co-sponsor it with her. Um, I think that, uh, well, I was going to make a joke about Chris Walker, but he asked me to stop making fun of him for being There are so many good opportunities yeah. to do it. So I'll, I'll have to find new ways to challenge him. But um, uh, no, I, I think this is uh, something that makes sense. We want the best and most talented people to work for the city, and this is a first step in, in getting them. And I would note that the last time the city council um, hired somebody, uh, we followed a similar process to this where we posted it online and invited the most qualified applicants um, to apply. So uh, so I would second this. Thank you, so we have a motion by Councilor Mahoney, seconded by Councilor Pamucci. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Number seven, 2020-038, a resolve exploring purchase of 797 Quincy Shore Drive for the purpose of preserving it is open space and coastal protection. Thank you, Councilor Phelan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I won't go into reading it, we all have it in, but um, the, resolve, the resolve is basically in, everyone knows the Beachcomber site at, at 797 uh, Quincy Ave. And a very short, Quincy Shore Drive, I'm sorry. 
In a very short time, it closed in 2015. It was in operation for 46 years. Everyone knows or, or was at an event or something down at the beach coma. It, but the building has become old and tired. And since then, several plans have come in, several proposals for redevelopment. A lot of them have trouble just getting through the environmental phase. It's not even getting to the city point. Um, the area is very sensitive environmentally. It's very uh, prone to flooding. Uh, back when I was a councilor, the city spent almost $25 million redoing storm drains and putting in a pump station, which now we're looking to replace the pump station. Um, water levels have, without a question, risen uh, versus when this was built back in the 1950s. Now we're at a point where just the, the storms that used to only come around once every the 50 year storm, 50 year storm is happening every five years now. And recently a storm back just two years ago on March and March when the, when the seawall was breached ended up coming over, flooding out the entire neighborhood down there. The, the pump station we had down there was coming up on 25 years old, couldn't handle it. So what's happened is this area now to build something, especially to put pavement or anything like that is just gonna cause, make the flooding problem that's already bad down there worse. And it's an environmental area. And in my resolve, I think the highest and best use is no longer a commercial property on this land or even a residential property because one of the proposals was for townhouses on this property. Um, it's just too prone to flooding. There's actually Sage and Brook that runs under there, right to an outfall pipe. I have pitches. I've only done two office hours, and I've got flooded with pitches and videos of watching the water come in on a, on a flood tide and just popping all the, you can see all the, the things pop and they just go back. I think we have a great resource in the, in the Wollaston Beach Reservation, and I think whenever we can get green space and open up more green space with all the things we have going on in the city with development and all that, I think here is a chance to get a piece of green space that can be added to what is a, already something that is enjoyed by thousands of Quincy residents on a daily basis, which is Wollaston Beach. So um, what I'm proposing is therefore asking the administration to explore the purchase of 797 Quincy Shore Drive for the per per purposes of reserving it as open space and coastal protection. So I'm referring that. I realize that we can't go out and spend tax money and everything. I'm looking for, for uh, community preservation money, any grant money, that there are grant money that are available for preserving open space, particularly along the coastal, the coastal zones. And this is a good coastal zone, a very sensitive area. And I'm looking to, uh, to pass this resolve and send it in to the administration to come back with recommendations on, um, on ways that we could explore to uh, make this, preserving this for open space and coastal, coastal protection. With that, Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to propose, I would like to make a motion to approve the, 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 the resolve. Great, so we'll, we have a motion to approve and then uh, we would also, I think we should move it into a committee and that way we can have a meeting uh, with an update when it comes back. Do you have a, for a committee you'd like uh, us to go into? The Parks Committee. Parks and Rec, you got space. it. Okay, so we have a motion to approve and move this into Parks and Rec. Do we have a second? Right. Seconded by Councilor Devona. Does anybody have any questions before we move on this? Okay. Oh, Councilor Devona? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I just, I know we're going to go into discussion of, uh, upon this vote here, but I, just ever since I've been a city councilor, um, even when I was on the school committee knocking on doors in 2013, I have been, this particular area, everything from basically the clam box all the way down past, um, you know, um, Tony's, Cafe Maddie, the whole Princess Eve, everything on that <clears throat> Walston Beach area, all I ever hear about is the extra flooding that's getting. Um, I commend my counselor um, Phelan for putting this forward and doing something about this based on um, <clears throat> what has happened with um, trying to build upon the, the old beach beachcomber um, site. Um, I've fielded many of calls, I've fielded many of emails over the last seven years on this, basically, and I'm, I'm glad it's, it's come before the city council and we'll have more discussion about it, but I will tell you, it, it becomes a lake back there. 
Um, you're sometimes within knee to waist deep sometimes in certain areas, and it, the water is just creeping into um, areas where we have no mitigation. Even with the uh, pumping station on the strand, it still has, has issues. And I think uh, as, a, as, a, as a body here, we need to um, discuss this a little bit more and hopefully um, do something about it. So I'm looking forward to the discussion on this, and I'm just letting you know everything behind there. Copley, Rice Road, Jordan, Chick, Morse, Labradeen, all those streets behind there, um, I'm constantly getting uh, phone calls and emails about this um, over the years. Um, sometimes it's not even a big storm. Sometimes it's just a, a regular, just a high tide. Water comes over and um, it causes many issues over there. So uh, just, I know we're gonna get into discussion, but I just wanted to let um, the folks know out there, um, go out there and take a look sometimes when there is a storm and see how much water's out there. So. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion, and thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor DeBrano. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Crow. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President Liang. Yes. Nine members. Thank you. Passes. Next item, please. Next item is number eight, 2020-1017. Resolve for mid-year project updates. Thank you. I do want to go to Council Mahoney, who did introduce this um, before we start the presentation tonight. But um, just for my colleagues and for those of you who are in the audience and for those listening at home, uh, these are really important updates that will be presented in front of us tonight with a lot of information um, included in each of the four categories before us. And so with that, uh, there are a couple of items just to set the stage for tonight. I am going to enact Rule 10 for the purposes of this discussion, uh, where each counselor has 15 minutes to speak for their first question. I want to ensure that all nine of us have an opportunity to ask questions for each department head. After that first 15 minutes, we'll circle back to you for a second, third, et cetera, a round of questioning. Um, I'm also going to, just as a note to the uh, department heads who are here this evening, again, for the purposes of the information that will be in front of us, we're going to start with the Department of Public Works, go to traffic, parking, alarm, and lighting. We're going to then jump down to number D, which is public buildings, and then round out with parks department. Um, with the hopes that we are going to be able to get through all four this evening, if we can't, we will resume um, at our next meeting. I, I'm not here for the interest of trying to cram everything in. Again, these are really important updates, and I want to make sure we all have an opportunity to get these updates from each of the department heads who've worked so hard on this information, as well as give my colleagues the opportunities to ask uh, the questions they need to. So with that, uh, Council Mahoney. Well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, this was, um, originally we were discussing this as being summer updates, but um, we moved it to mid-year updates because we weren't able to get that in front of us before in the fall. So really the idea is that we, 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 we um, know a lot of work gets done in all of these departments and it gives the departments an opportunity to come before us and to let us know some of the successes that they've had, the challenges that they had, and then to ensure the public knows them. And my hopes is to make sure that we also know whether or not these projects, many of these projects that we're doing that are funded in multiple different ways that we're staying on budget and, um, and delivering the, ex the expectation of what the taxpayers are anticipating. So with that, I thank all the departments for putting things together. Um, I did get the TPAL presentation. I didn't get the other ones ahead of time, so I'm hoping that everybody had enough time to be able to review things. Um, and depending on the timing, like we said, I think it's gonna be parks. If we don't get to everything, I'm anticipating that parks will probably be um, at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Council Kroll. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Just for the record, I would like to be recorded as uh, positive uh, or in the affirmative for item number four on the agenda, just before we jump into this. You got it, thank you. Municipal aggregation, thank Adam you. Madam Clerk, do you have that? I do. Great, um, any other questions from my colleagues before we begin? Great, okay, so if we could have the uh, chair of the Department of Public Works come up, we'll start with that presentation. Again, go into the questions and then move forward from there. Good evening, Good evening. President, City Councilors. Um, I've supplied you this evening with three packages. Uh, the first one looks like this, which is an overview of all the work we've done. The second one is a list of every single roadway we've touched this summer or this, this year for water, sewer, and paving. And the third one is just a, it's a tracking device we use internally on a weekly basis, and it will list all those roads, the work, when it was started, and when it was complete. And on the back of that, I've also added all the work that National Grid 
has done and is currently doing in the city. So I guess to start, I can go to the first page. Um, so the first portion uh, was of, of our roadway water sewer construction. Um, we did roughly 9.5 miles of paving, 43 roadways. Uh, the bid prices came in at 12, 12 million, and we came in almost 600,000 under those bid prices. Um, water main replacement, we did roughly 5.2 miles, 34 roads. The bid price was 8.1 million, and we came in about 1.174 million under that cost. In sewer pipelining, we did 1.8 miles, 18 roadways. Uh, we came in about $68,000 under the bid price. Um, we also did maintenance, 20 miles of maintenance. We did 13,000 feet or 2.5 miles of video inspection. Uh, this was actually part of our roadway work. Uh, after someone comes in and does drain work, uh, after someone comes in and does water main work or National Grid, we, we actually video to make sure none of our drains or, wa or water mains or sewer, sewers have been damaged. So uh, that's something we added this year to our work. Um, roadway cra uh, crack sailing, we did 85 roadways, 16.9 miles. Uh, sidewalk work this summer, we uh, completed 303 addresses, 88 in concrete, 201 in asphalt. We also added the uh, Russell Park Island curbing job. Part of our drainage system maintenance, we collected 1,453 tons of material from street sweeping. We cleaned 4,500 roughly catch basins and inspected. That's just about half of all we have. We placed 20 catch basins. We visited 175 outfalls and inspected. Did 71 dry weather inspections. That's part of our MS4 requirements. We repaired two outfalls. Um, Carl Road, we basically rebuilt that and inspected 67 tide gates. Other work, as we know, we uh, put out a bid for Adam Shore seawalls. Um, we opened the bid at the end of August. Uh, we awarded that to MIG con uh, contractors at the end of September. Um, actually, in this week, we're starting, starting to mobilize, um, and the goal is to start construction somewhere towards the end of March. We worked on a water we're working on a water master plan for the, for the city, uh, and it's a revised hydraulic model. We started in August, and we hope to be completed by uh, fall of 2020. Um, stormwater inundation model in the town brook, that was started in March of last year and completed in June. And DPW is going through a document scanning process, uh, engineering department. We have thousands of plans and documents and we're, uh, we're scanning all of those now. The next page will show you our actual, this is part of our capital improvement summary. Again, the percentage of roads we've done uh, in the five-year project, five-year capital improvement plan on the water mains, we've completed 56.8% of those water mains on the original CIP in basically in two years. Um, the roadway uh, CIP, we've finished roughly 52.8% in two years. Uh, we're currently assessing 25 roads this year for new water mains in that process, and we're assessing 40 roads for paving this coming year. Um, we're also working on another 41 roads, 3.9 miles of sewer work to be done this year. And again, these are just the special projects we've had. It doesn't account for all the daily, daily jobs we have on a daily basis at DPW, water, sewer, and drain. So with that, I'd open that up for any questions. Great. Thank you, Al. Do we have questions? Oh, yes. Councilor Kane. Al, thanks so much for putting this together. Um, this is great uh, reading material. Could you make sure that we get this electronically sure. so we can 
I can distribute this to my folks in Ward 3 who would love to see this. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Kane. Does anybody else have any other questions for Al? Councillor Phelan? Thank you. This is a great report. I would love to see it all, all the information. It's great to see it. But then you realize there's a whole ton of other stuff to do. So uh, uh, just we're going to be doing those meetings again like we did last year, I'm assuming. And, Absolutely, uh, Chuck. Okay. Yep. I, I, I think, I, should, Sorry. I, think yeah. I already got a call about setting it up. But I think those were good meetings to go around and set one up. And I'll, I'll call you in with my date. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilor Phelan. We're going to go to Councilor Mahoney and then Councilor Pamucci and then Councilor Bona. Councilor Mahoney? Is it my, my yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I thought you had your hand up first. <laughs> Did you? Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, Al, thank you very much. Um, first, I want to thank you, Al, because um, no matter what time I get in touch with you and no matter what the issue is, um, and you, you you respond and you and you send somebody out to make sure, in particular on Common Street just recently, um, with National Grid coming and um, not having the um, the the metal cover that they put down um, secured, you weren't able to you were you were able to take care of that within 45 minutes. It was it was rather amazing. Um, For the record, I called them like two hours. I'm sorry. I, well, yeah. no, this is Just certainly so you know. <laughs> point of clarity. Yeah, point of clarity. clarity. I know for a fact, Brian, that it was because of your phone call yeah. that Al was ready for me, <laughs> and that's the reason yeah. why. But it, what I'm, what I just want people to know, though, is that. It's it's a 24/7. It's it, you're on call 24/7, and I'm sure he's psyched when he gets all of our phone calls and text messages at 10 o'clock at night time, and he responds immediately. And um, and I think he had an, you had an emergency someplace else in the city um, with the wa water main someplace else in the city. So I know this is a difficult job, and it's a big city, and we have a lot of challenges. Um, and you know when I, and no matter where we go, there's, there's a road that, that has issues. I know today I was driving down um, Harvard Street and it looked like there was a water issue. Maybe you could, was there a water issue on Harvard Street today? There's a, there's a leak we're checking out right now on Harvard Street, correct? Yeah, and that's just so unfortunate because you just got done <laughs> fixing that road. I have a new appreciation for when things get taken care of and you see that happen because it's, you know, it's a beauty, it's, you know, it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful, it's done, it's, and it looks nice and then you have to dig it up. Um, and that was something that we didn't, that was, that was not, a road that we were doing because we had water sewer lines. It was, um, I forget what it's called, but it was the micro sealing. Micro -sealing. Yep. So, um, so hopefully when they address whatever it is over there, it won't hurt our streets too much. Um, specifically though, when I'm going through this, and this is a lot, and, and what's, and I, I know that you were all pulling this together today, and in the future it would be great if we could get it before the meeting so we can go through these types of things because it's helpful to have information um, because we're all trying to go through it really quick, looking for the street that we that somebody might have called us for. But more importantly, it's it's just good to see all of this and how much you've completed because there's a lot of work that's been done. When we're looking up on Quarry Street um, and all the way down to Common Street, that's a challenging street. I got it's been it's a lot of work. Could you just go into some details on that specific street? Sure. We um, well, I think Councilor Palmucci asked us a few years back to pave that section. Um, when we looked to pave it, we realized we needed a new water main. Mm -hmm. So we did the water main last year. Uh, in the meantime, National Grid has come in, and they need a new gas line there. So that's what's going on now. Mm -hmm. um, they should be done this spring, and we plan to pave this paving season, okay. that section of Quarry Street. And that's all, and that, is that part of the CIP monies for the paving? That was part point? of the CIP, correct. Okay. So, I mean, it's a lot of work, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. And then the hope is, is that once that's all, all done, that hopefully nothing will leak and we'll, be, we'll have a, a nice new road over there. And it's, um, but it's a, it's a painful process, but there's, a, there's multiple things that are going on. And, and that's a challenge too, because you have to manage the national grid and they don't always do things like you think they're going to do. There's been several phone calls. I've, I've, I've got my eyes opened about how national grid does some of the work when they're supposed to close up a road at one, one o'clock in the afternoon, but they don't do it until one o'clock in the morning. You know, it disturbs neighbors. But I do encourage people at home if there are problems that are happening within your area when it comes to work that's happening, to not hesitate to reach out because you're the, not that you're looking to have us get in touch with you all the time, but, it, but you're very responsive and you can't, you can't address something that you don't know about. Um, so I truly believe that's helpful. Can, if I go into the page two, when you, when you mention um, roadway repairs and sidewalks, um, new water mains, and you're saying in 2020 they're assessing 40 roads 
or potential seven miles for new um, repairs and sidewalks. Is that is that where's is that new money that will be? That's part of the CIP. It's still part mm -hmm. of the CIP. Yes. So yep. So you'll be when you make those decisions for 2020 as to what roads those are going to be, or are they part? Is it part of the presentation here, or is it something you're still assessing? No, we we can. We're actually designing those roadways now. Okay. And I'd be happy to get a list of those roads. Okay. Yeah. When you. <coughs> God bless you. Yeah. When do you think you'll be um, be making those decisions for, for 2020? We plan hopefully to go out to bid mm -hmm. uh, sometime, maybe by the end of this month, month okay. early March. So maybe by by the time that you're ready to go out to bid and you know the streets you're going out to bid for, it would be really important. I'm sure all of the councilors would agree that it would be great to know what streets that we're that you're identifying. And I'd be happy to give you those streets this week. We can send. That would be to very all helpful. So um, and the same thing with the new sewer work. Um, there's there's a lot to be said because that this is one of the things that that people and rightfully so I mean it's there's a lot of work to be done in Quincy and there's a lot of work being done in Quincy and it's very hard because this is the very thing that we you know we we travel on our roads and when our roads are in disrepair it's um, it's everybody suffers for it. your car suffers the traffic suffers everybody suffers but I know that you also work and I just want to make sure that this is mentioned too I'm, I'm assuming because when we're talking about Quarry Street there's a lot of um, you know, configurations for the traffic that you're working closely with the TPAL um, to make sure that we're looking at those roads to make any adjustments to it to make it a safer road. Because Quarry Street is, I, I, I think you would agree, it's probably one of the, there's a lot of dangerous roads in Quincy, but it's a dangerous road in Quincy. Um, Brian's looking at me. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it's it, there's certain sections of it where it kind of goes from a single to a double that people think it's like, you know, it's a, it's a racing place. And it's not, it's not really wide enough for that, um, for those two, two, two um, car lanes to go through, but you know, it's a, it's a challenge and you can see some pretty um, hairy things that happen on that road. But I just, again, I'm going to go back to the fact that there's a lot of work that's being done. And although it may not be the street, everybody wants their street done. Um, you know, I had, I, you know, every, it, I think my my street in Shawmut Street was promised like 15 years ago. But there's priorities and things that happen, and it's helpful if you could give us an idea again. And you've done it before. How those priorities are set, and how you determine what roads are uh, the necessities to be done. Absolutely. If you could, you just maybe enhance just for our, the general people at home to understand like how how a street gets picked and how you know how you know you assess that situation. Sure. We have a we have a. Um paving master plan. We have a pavement condition index for every street in the city. Mm -hmm. now, some things, sometimes we get thrown a curveball because if we get a street, we find out that we have to replace a water main. Mm -hmm. um, once you replace that water main, uh, you have sewer work. That street pretty much becomes a priority because you dig it up, it just becomes trash. Mm -hmm. um, so, so a lot of the paving is being driven, driven by the water main work. Mm -hmm. or the sewer work. Um, so that, that gets thrown into the mix. Um, so every street we do a new water main on, the following year we try to pave. Right. Um, so that's, that gets thrown into the condition. What about a street, like I just know, and I can't remember the name of the street, and I'll follow up with you after the, after the meeting tomorrow with the street. I know that um, there was water mains done, and it was kind of in a neighborhood, and there was, the streets were done over, and there was like one section of one street that was not paved over. What happens in that situation when you have like, you know, it's, it's, it was part of, it was part of a, um, I know it was part of some work that was being done, but it didn't get paved. If something, is there any time that there's certain reasons as to why something like that would happen? I'm not sure of this. You'd have, I'd have to know the street, and it okay. could be um, just running out of time to do that portion of the street. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd really. I'll be happy to follow yeah. up with that street tomorrow sure. with you, just because I don't have it with me tonight, and I couldn't tell you. I could look in this, and it could very well have been taken care of as a following year. Sometimes what happens too, and I and I think I've talked to you about that before too, where it's you, you're doing a lot of work, and it's weather dependent too for certain things, and what doesn't get done in the fall might get picked up in the spring. So you know, you, it's 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 one of those situations as well. All right, I I am. Um, I think I'm way below my 15 minutes, but I think I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to follow up with a couple of questions for you tomorrow. But um, I do know, like, there are people that will get in touch with me, and, and specifically in wards, when there are certain streets, we can send them over to you, and you can tell us what the rating is for that street. Sure. Absolutely. Um, 
And I know that if it's something that's really dangerous, like you know, a pothole or something, that, that, that you guys are out um, filling those as well. It's not the same as having a new street, I realize, but uh, those are just important to make sure we're maintaining um, for, for roads that are in disrepair. The last question, is one other question, I'm sorry, there's one other question. When you do, how many contractors do we hire when we're doing um, the, the roads over? And then how do you how do you manage that throughout the city? Because sometimes we start projects, what looks like it should be done in several weeks takes months. Well, so. a lot depends on the bid. Um, we, this year we had a situation where we had three road contracts and we ended up with two bidders. Mm -hmm. And it, it, quite honestly, it was an issue for us. Um, it was just too much work for one of the, one of the um, contractors. <clears throat> one of the things that slowed work down a little bit, again, was our decision to go in and do, uh, to video all our drain lines after the fact. Um, we ran into a, a situation where someone had done damage. We were ready to pave. Uh, we found that out. And mm -hmm. we, obviously we had a crushed drain line. So we, just, we made a decision that anywhere we had work done by National Grid or the water main companies, we were gonna video those lines. So part of, one of the problems was that we slowed down the contractors too, but um, you know, for us to be prudent and do the best, we don't wanna dig those roads up again. Right. We made the decision that that was the best thing to do. Um, so, but this year we're looking at how we do our bids, we may limit the amount of roads a contractor can have. Uh, we're talking about that now. Mm -hmm. We just want to be more efficient next be year. Be more efficient. Yep. So, and the, and the last question that I had, I know that we just had the presentation last week for the, I'm going to mess this up, for the, for the, for the GIS, GIS? GIS. Yep. GIS. I mess up my letters. Um, so when you were so so now that you have that completely mapped throughout the whole city too, and you have the 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 videos too, I am assuming of all the the sewer lines and stuff, that will make it a little bit more efficient and faster for you to be able to make those decisions as to what's a priority. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean we still go in and do all the camera work. Mm -hmm. it's, um, you know we're always looking at new technology mm -hmm. uh, to see if there's an easier way. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking at something right now. Okay, but so, right. so it's always a changing. Yeah, but, world out there. but that system that system does help you be efficient as to um, oh, absolutely. the work you're doing, and then you ha you add on other technology pieces that are also helping you make those decisions as to um, what's the best direction or the, the the best use of our funds to be able to solve certain roads and certain priorities. I will say one of the feedbacks that I did get from some of the neighborhoods, the larger projects that you did, was the fact that we had um, the contracts that we had were not very they were they were having some problems with how they were being talked to the the neighbors were being talked to by the um, maybe the contractors themselves. I know that there was some conversations about that, and um, there was change in a tune when you know when you got involved. It's unfortunate that that does happen as well, and I do think that's something that we have to be more um, aware of because certainly. Um, we we hire people to do a job and we have to manage them to make sure that they're doing that job that we hired them to do um and notifications for people um in neighborhoods when they're doing that they should know that they're not going to have access to their house and how long it's going to be that they're not going to have access to their house because there were some challenges in certain areas with people with handicaps and um being able to get an access into their home so i do know that that was something i know you communicate to them we had regular conversations about that too and we're improving on that as well i hope so thank you very much i'm gonna thank you to, council to stop now thank you council primary thank you um al thank you for all the work you do you and the team um what what are we looking at here what what is this a review of is this just everything you did in the last fiscal year or is this this is pretty much the, from last spring up until up okay. until now. This is all the road work. So it covers both general budget and CIP. Uh, it's not really. This is mostly uh, CIP work. Okay. Or, or MWRA funded work. Uh, this is not. Uh, the only thing that's general budget work would be this. Uh, well, I, I can't. Didn't say we that. add it's, money for road paving in the general budget in the last chapter ninety money? It's, it's we don't have money for road paving okay. in the general budget. I thought we added some. You have a, we have a fund in, the, uh, in, in water uh, for emergency. If we have to do emergency water main work, we have a fund in there we can do road repairs. Okay. Um, 
All right, so but this is mostly- It's uh, mostly, I mean, but uh, other things, uh, you know, the drainage work, uh, the drainage and the system maintenance, that's all general fund work. Um, some of the design work. But the road work, CIP. The road work and the okay. water work and the sewer work is CIP and MWRA um, money, uh, state revolving fund money. You, you gave a statistic, I thought, that I don't see in here that your some percentage done with the CIP work that was designated for yeah, the five-year plan? If you look at the last page, this, this page here, Counselor, uh, if you look at the second page there, it will tell you for water, we're 56.8% uh, complete, and then on the roadway, we're 52.8% complete. Does anyone see where he's saying? Oh, I see it. Okay, no. Got it. All right, so on roadways, we're 52% done to the five-year five Correct. project. And... What's the percentage of budget that was spent? It looks like you're under. Well, we're under the bid price, and we're still assessing those numbers to see where we are. Um, we're, we're using primarily, we've been, you know, CIP money, because in that five-year plan, we have projected out Chapter 90 money for five years. So we, we're just kind of watching that. Um, and when you say projected out Chapter 90 money, you're saying to offset so that, the plans of the streets? Yeah, that I mean, when we hit, did the right? five-year plan, we took, it was a combination of CIP and five years of Chapter 90. So, right. Um, so this year, I mean, we'll have a better idea when the bids come in this year to see exactly where we are. Um, you know, obviously, you don't know what the construction costs are always going up, so... Um, you know, we planned this out two years ago. Where are the costs today? Um, and we assess that every year and we do the bids. So what, what impact will it have on us moving forward that you've been able to do 50% in two years um, of the five-year plan? Does that, mean, does that mean we would be well-suited to allocate additional monies sooner than we perhaps planned? because we've been able to accomplish essentially a five-year plan in say four years. So then in the fourth year, we'd be talking about, well, let's expend more money into that, another. Is that kind of what yes, we're I heading on? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I think it's terrific. I think, you know, I, obviously we get a lot of, I think it's terrific we're doing this much work that we're doing it this aggressively. I think for a long time, and I, I say this, I've said this publicly and privately to a number of folks, I, I think for a long time, you know, I've been up here you know, 10 years, but for a long time that I've been up here, we have neglected the roads. We've done a lot of great things in the city, building new schools and, and parks and, and, a, and a lot of um, other uh, areas of the infrastructure that we've invested in. But for a long time, I think we, we didn't keep up with the, the road work like we should have and, and thus the necessity for the um, capital improvement plan, which I'm glad we're doing. I feel like we're getting back on track with the, uh, with the roads and we're, you know, you've been able to really really take a big bite out of it, which is great. Uh, and I always tell folks, I mean, you're always, it's, it's an inconvenience. I always tell people, well, you know, it's an inconvenience for a couple of weeks. We won't be back to pave it for like 50 years, so don't worry, you know. Just bear with us for two weeks. Um, on the sidewalks, we're all caught up, right? We're able to tackle the sidewalks as we go on a yearly basis. Yeah, I mean, now we have, we're, we're, we have our list where we've been, what we, Part of our engineer's job is every call we get, we go out and analyze that sidewalk. So we have a large list again starting this spring. And you think so you'd be able to tackle that list? Yeah, we, uh, we, just, we just put out a sidewalk bid for concrete work. We do all the asphalt work in-house. So um, we'll see where that goes. That's, that's, like, uh, that's like trees. It's, right, it's, right. It's never going to stop. Never I always, I, when I get phone calls and someone tells me or I see someone at an event and they say, oh, you got to take care of my sidewalk. It's a mess. I said, did you call? Because they take care of them. If it's, if it's really that bad, they, we're on it. We've, we've been doing that for, I don't know, maybe four years. We've caught up on the backlog so that if you call uh, the DPW or somehow you get the, the address of the sidewalk engineer goes out there, and if it needs to be done, it's, it gets done in the spring. So I always encourage people to call, you know, because um, we're on top of it. Uh, okay. I think that's I think that's all of my questions. But I, I look forward to um, finishing up the CIP early and, and getting a request for 
some additional expenditure to get, get right after it. I know it's the last thing you probably want to do, your mental sanity. Uh, Mr. Walker smiling over here. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But, um, well, thank you for, I know it's, and it's, I mean, you mentioned it, that it's, you, you're doing the daily work of the department. And then this is a significant undertaking. I mean, this is a massive undertaking. Um, and, you know, not just for you, but for other folks in the department, you know, who are essentially doing two jobs, really. I mean, you're managing this as a job in and of itself that I think was perhaps um, unwittingly thrust upon you when, um, when we passed it um, and the mayor uh, presented it and, and put it in place. But um, so I thank you and, and the folks who are working on it um, for, the, for the effort. I think the city's better for it, so. I wanna put in a plug too for my engineering department because in the past and even last year, we went out to private contractors to design our water mains. And we this year are designing our water mains in house. And um, they're doing a great job and we're probably gonna save about $400,000 in wow. design costs. So I think that's, I just wanna put a plug in for those guys because it's, it's it's, it's exciting for them, too. They're really excited about doing that. So. Well, I think they'll be thrilled when you give them the bonus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Pavici. Councilor DeBona. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Commissioner, for coming in tonight and keeping us up to date. Um, just overall, just this past summer, you having the uh, workshops at all the ward wards, all ward councilors had their workshops at most of the schools about what was going to be done for the um, the summer and, and updating for one year out um, water main, sewer, road road and sidewalk repair. Um, I thought they were very helpful because you had the contractor there, you had the engineer there, you had your team there, so all the folks could go that was getting work done and ask questions there and have actually a business card for anything that came up. Um, I know we had some issues around some of the schools because they were going to be opening in September, um, taking some them off certain jobs to get some of these schools prioritized and done before school started. I know it was uh, definitely challenging at Marymount School um, over there um, on Narragansett. Um, but I, I want to thank you for this, this list here and where we are uh, percentage-wise of, of the five-year CIP and where we are today. Um, especially being under budgeted here with certain items, which is great. Um, um, your attention to detail is great. And this is very important for us to move forward. Um, one of the biggest questions I have is, is, is we're talking about gas lines. With the uh, national grid lockout last year, where do you think we are on implementing and doing the proper gas lines to do these other road work repairs? Um, National Grid has been extremely aggressive trying to catch up. Um, we meet with them now uh, every two weeks. Um, right now they currently have, I believe, 16 crews in the city working this winter. They're trying to ramp up to 20. They have our street list. They have the streets that we're putting water mains in this year. We're trying to get, they're trying to get ahead of that. So. Um, by this spring, they tell us they will be caught up. It, that's, that's great. That's good information. They caught up to the old list. They, they plan to be aggressive in the city of Quincy over the next several years. I know we were concerned. As we, do, yeah. as we do streets, we give them the list of streets, and if they have to put a gas line in, now's the time to do it. Is there a particular strategy based upon, I'm going to have conversations offline with you about, you know, when do you do a certain street? Do you wait until it's at a certain grade or do you kind of go mid grade and then said, let's micro seal it. We'll save some dough on the back end. How, how is your strategy well, about how do you attack the city? Well, the Where do you get your advice from? Where do you get your the information from? The micro is primarily we do for main roads because you have to do very large amounts for them to come in. So we, you know, like we did Hancock Street this past summer. We've done Washington, Quincy Ave, Harvard. Those streets are very long stretches. Um, so that is roughly half the price of, pay, of a regular road construction job. Um, again, we base on uh, 
we look at the roads with the pavement, pavement condition indexes. And again, a lot of it is water main driven or sewer driven. Um, you know, if we tear up a road, we're going to have to we're going to have to repair it. So it's, it's all tied together. Um, and then obviously we try to be fair. <laughs> we look at all the wards. Uh, we try to, you know, know you do. <laughs> repair equally. Uh, everyone has needs. So um, that's kind of the big picture. Can you talk just a little bit real quick to just uh, how do you do it with the sewer and the water lines and how do, how do you have to let it settle? And how long does it have to settle for, for, for you to come in and pave it afterwards? How we, do you try, we try to let that, if we do water mains and sewer this year, we try to let those settle over the winter and then pave the following year. Gas isn't as bad because the gas line is down, is, doesn't go down that far. And if we feel is, we test compaction and make sure that the trenches are done right, then we can go in later that year. Is it usually a six to nine month window of settling around uh, that? You know, it depends if, if it's, if you're doing a, a road late in the year, you want it to settle over the winter time. But, um, you know, if you, if we do a road in early spring, if we could still po possibly pave it by um, later, late fall. Um, I think we're doing a great job. We're a little bit more on the aggressive side on getting some of these roads, sidewalks, water mains, um, sewer repairs, everything. And I, I commend you for your, for, you know, when I call you, you're right on it right away. I'll check on it today and I get an answer by the end of day. And it's been huge working with your engineer, Paul Costello and, and your team. You guys are on top of things. Um, I know we didn't get into here with the snow removal business, but uh, you guys are doing a great job. Just keep up the good work. Hopefully we have an okay winter here in the end there and uh, we'll be okay talking about budget season when Thank we have you back again. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Carl. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, through you to Commissioner Grazioso. Good evening, Al. How are you? Councilor. Um, you know, a couple things. Just uh, I know a lot of uh, a lot of ground was covered here in this discussion, so I'm going to uh, try not to rehash it. But again, I want to just kind of point out the fact because I I think about it when I when I can contemplate just working in public life, being of service to the community. I mean, the, the reality of the situation is, at least from my perspective, um, you know, my job is to really deliver a, um, you know, a memorable customer service experience that's, that's fast to break it down in, in very easily digestible terms. And um, I think you personify those characteristics, uh, particularly when, you know, the DPW and questions come to me as a ward counselor, usually they're fairly pressing at the moment because, you know, whatever's going on, good, bad, or indifferent is uh, substantially impacting somebody's life. So I just want to publicly thank you first and foremost, because, you know, you, you do, to Council Mahoney's point. We call, we email, you know, you're, you're back in front of us by close of business. And it goes a long way because, you know, my job is, again, to, to provide answers to questions and hopefully solutions to problems, but I'm only as good as the people I work with. So, um, you know, you're one, of, you're one of the good people to work with. So Thank I just you, wanted to, you're welcome. Um, as far as roads go, I mean, Council Palmucci sort of encapsulated what we're speaking uh, about much here this evening. Uh, I've been sitting here for, for some time now and have long been uh, an advocate for investments in our road infrastructure. And it's been my firm belief, and it still is, as it was day one, the best demonstration to a taxpayer as to how their tax dollars are being spent is when you have a road crew on their street redoing whether it's doing their street or redoing their sidewalk but you know there's your tax dollars how to work so um, I've tried to make sort of the legislation that I've sponsored here locally at the City Council um, you know kind of back back up that sentiment so um, I'm, I was tickled when we started to get rolling on a five-year capital plan and to Council Palmucci's point um, the need is so great uh, and the desire is so wide that I really don't um, you know, this is nothing but good stuff when we're putting resources into uh, streets uh, and sidewalks. Um, you know, a couple of things that I was thinking about as we were listening to the presentation, and this often comes to me, and I don't know sort of what my colleagues' interpretation is, but many folks will come, and you had mentioned it, like you did the heat map of the streets, and, you know, people went out and basically did, like, assigned a letter grade to a street, right? A, B, C, D, I'm assuming, was kind of... How it worked? We have a we have a scale from one to a hundred, and so the numerics. Um, okay, but 
I get the question all the time, like my street's bad and I will go to that street and visually be able to validate that statement. And like, yes, your street is bad. Like for example, Chase Street down in Quincy Point, it's literally crumbled into pieces. Um, that's not currently, as I understand it, within the capital plan, but there's certainly a need for it. So while I can completely agree with the resident, I often wonder like, is there other uh, competing priorities that may alter that numerical assignment that's given to that street? Um, yes, no, maybe. I mean, we have, the problem is we have over yeah. 1,100 streets in the city and there's a lot of streets like that. Mm -hmm. we, um, and some have the same sure. you know, uh, pavement condition index. Um, so if, again, if we have a street that we have to replace a water main, that's a different gonna, ball game. gonna get kicked to the top of the list. And um, so we try to do a mix. We try to do water main roads and we try to do roads that don't need water mains. Mm -hmm. that we, and that's part of the process. And then we have the streets that we try to do maintenance on and we crack sale, um, try to maintain those streets longer. So. You um, know what, and, and maybe if, and if this does exist, please excuse my um, sort of missing it, but I think what would be helpful for me as a ward counselor, and I don't know, again, if some of my colleagues would, would agree with this, if there was some sort of like frequently asked questions brochure as it relates to how your street becomes part of the selection process and to kind of take that a step further. And I don't know, but when I think about some of the technological advances that, that exist out there, um, you know, there's, uh, I'll try to visually describe it, but there's a company out there that does a lot with like uh, financial literacy stuff. So essentially what they do is they take a complex uh, concept like saving for college and they'll break it down and it'll be basically like a, almost like an animated caricature mm -hmm. that sort of shows like, you know, some of the, some of the tips and steps to kind of get to the, uh, the end result. So I don't, I don't know if there's applications out there that, uh, that exist and or could tie into, um, you know, getting information out to the public as to what the process is for your street being rated and ultimately being done. Because you know, and, and you said it, the, the human cry for this stuff is, it's, it's, it's exponential. And the resource is a finite at this time, right? If money wasn't an option, I'm sure we'd do all 320 plus miles of, of road. Is that what it is? Three, 327? Something like Sorry. That. Anyways. Yeah. 230 but miles of road. I guess my point is um, if there's any way for us to use a communication medium outside of just sort of what we know, but some, a document that's centralized and lives somewhere and allows us to push it out through our email distribution or hard copy mailing, I think that would be extremely helpful. Just to let people know, here's the process, um, you know, that we take as a department to, to get to, you know, the, the finding for when your street is gonna be completed. And, and to counsel the bonus standpoint, like I agree with those town halls, they're awesome. And <laughs> what I've since learned, and we spoke a lot over the summer, uh, you had an aggressive undertaking um, that was not easy to pull off what you did last summer. And I know, you know, with folks, um, you know, every, they want their street done, but once construction ensues, like that's a completely different ball game. And the council Palmucci's point, it's like the way that I've always interpreted it, it's a, it's, it's a small price to pay for the progress that, uh, that generates in the end. Um, but again, yeah, just sitting here, listening to the presentation and sort of playing off my own experiences, I think having just kind of an off-the-shelf document that we could share with the community, I think would go a long way. And I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to rallying up for another round of those meetings, which my understanding is they're coming pretty soon. So, um, you know, I, that's, that's a good thing when we have people in a room talking about investments in infrastructure. Um, I just firmly believe that, 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 that that's, a, that's a home run. So thanks again for your diligence and look forward to a... Uh, Another season of roads. Thank you, Councillor. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Harris. Um, good evening, Commissioner. Um, Councillor. I I'd be remiss not to say to say just be quiet and sit here and um, while folks are praising you, and I I have to tell you, 
that I'm, I, I'm one of the people that are going to praise your work. When I get an email, a text message on a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when most people are packing it in for the weekend and, um, and not, not reaching out, not me reaching out to you, but you reaching out to me, letting me know, like last Friday, letting me know that there was going to be people in the area and just a heads up. Um, the proactiveness of that is, it, it, it really makes a difference for, for, for our job, especially, um, you know, all of the counselors here when they get phone calls um, or they're reacting to social media of, of some type. Um, and how you handled some of the things that you've handled since I've been on the council. Uh, um, one of them in particular was um, a couple years ago when there was a, prob a problem at on Victory and uh, East Guantanamo Street, where um, it, it, the, the problem was so bad that it was literally going to cripple Marina Bay, and you folks, you, you folks were out there, 24 hours, over 24 hours, making sure that uh, uh, the folks out there were all set. And you know, we have the issue going on right now. On my way to work here and the work this morning, those folks have been out on East Guantanamo Street all day. I'm glad the weather is working out for them um, because they work really hard. My only problem I really had have with you is is your selection of the um, engineer, uh, Paul Costello. You should have never hired him because he is a graduate of Don Bosco High. You never know that, right? What's that? Right? And nobody, and who's that? Nobody knows who Don Bosco High is. But. Didn't they close the school after you two graduated? After we graduated, they closed the school. Yes, they did. And, uh, and, and we have plenty of brine left for the rest of the winter. Um, we good? Okay. We good. I want to thank you for all you do, uh, thank you, Al. Appreciate thank you that. so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Counselor. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for Al? I want to thank all of you for honoring the 15-minute rule. But if anybody has any other questions before we let him go. No? Oh, Counselor Kane? Sorry. No? And I just do want to acknowledge that all these groups that are presenting tonight, um, I've been very uh, grateful to have in the Ward 3 town hall meetings through 2019, uh, where each group did provide thorough updates on all their projects, how the roads get done, how the trees get done, how the signs get put up. So um, this is nothing new for Ward 3. We're very accustomed to having these sort of updates, and I appreciate uh, Dave Murphy, Ali Rule, and uh, Chris Cassani, as well as the commissioner uh, from the DPW before. So thanks for taking time tonight. And uh, even the three who haven't gone yet, please make sure you send the electronic documents because I do send those out to folks too. So thank you very much again. Great. Thank you, Councilor Kane. Al, thank you so much. I just, uh, I will obviously reiterate everything that my colleagues have said, but specifically, um, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done with the non-English speaking residents in the city. I know that um, more often than not, when I'm reaching out to you to go to those homes, you know, you're right out there communicating with them directly and addressing the issues for them. And so I commend you for that effort. And, um, you know, I know that we'll have more coming in front of you. So thank you for your time and thank you for the update. Okay, next we're going to go to traffic parking alarm and lighting. Chris? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to present some of the updates uh, from our department from uh, over the last year. Um, I do want to thank Allie for being here, certainly, and my entire staff. I also want to thank my wife. Um, all of us I know who are here tonight, I thank our significant others. My wife is home right now with two very sick children, so I uh, certainly hope when I get home that they're asleep and that the third one isn't sick as well. Um, so thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, tonight, I wanted to kind of break the update down into a few different um, sections. The first section really would be to talk about some of the items that we discussed last year relative to some of the signalization upgrades that we made, both in terms of video detection, um, adaptive signals, and um, advanced de uh, detection technology for emergency vehicles. Um, we do have, and that sort of goes back to the $2.3 million appropriation prior to me starting my job uh, at Traffic and Parking. Uh, then we'll get into the city CIP and some of the state managed projects and give you an idea of um, where those things stand. And then spend some time certainly on pedestrian, bike, and speed reduction accommodations. 
um, and the vital importance, obviously, that making improvements on that front has for everyone in the city, everyone of all ages, everyone of all mobility levels. So in terms of uh, video detection upgrades in our adaptive program, um, we've been fully deployed at 23 intersections with our adaptive platform. The results of that have been very positive. Um, in places, more than a 15% improvement. In places, a little bit less. But on average, a 15% improvement in overall travel time through the key corridors. And again, that um, the, the 23 intersections mainly focus in and around the downtown area. Um, one of the positive things about that platform is that as technology unfolds and new functionality comes available, particularly with connected vehicles, we really will be at the forefront of being able to take advantage of those things because of the investments that we made uh, last year and, and the year before that. Um, we have video detection at roughly 40 of our intersections. We have 55 intersections right now that we can control remotely from our office, which is incredibly invaluable, especially for Alley, as uh, you know, the old days you had to drive out to every one of these intersections, very time consuming, very difficult to do. Um, right now, again, we have 55 of them. Our goal is to bring that up to about 70, um, which I believe we'll be able to accomplish over the next year, year and a half. Um, and we also plan on installing video detection in probably you know, another 10 or so intersections. I was looking at some data earlier today from some eight intersections that I picked, some sort of our eight gateway intersections on a date, uh, January 22nd. Um, it's a Wednesday in January. Nearly a quarter million cars traveled through those eight intersections alone. There are huge chunks of the city that I'm not accounting for in that data. That just gives you an idea of how busy it is in the city. Um, it's not uncommon when we collect our data out here at 1250 Hancock Street to see 6,000 pedestrians crossing the street just in the intersection alone. There's an enormous amount of activity on our roads, an enormous amount of activity that we're trying to manage as best we possibly can. And again, the, up, the, uh, tech te the technology that we've invested in, the staff that we have, allows us to manage that, I would say, as, as well as you possibly can, um, given these incredible volumes that we do see every day. Um, the applied information we, t we spoke about last year, that's an emergency preemption platform. We now have that deployed at 27 intersections. If you look at this figure, I know it's a little bit small. But in North Quincy, in Wollaston, in Quincy Center, in parts of uh, South and West Quincy, we have this technology deployed. This technology gives us the ability to remotely see what's happening at these intersections, but it also gives the fire department the ability to be able to achieve preemption through these incredibly congested corridors. I'm gonna be working with the fire department to deploy this technology and test all of this technology over the coming weeks. Um, Deputy Chief Joe Jackson has really been uh, instrumental in, in some of that coordination. Some of the deployments that we're seeing right here, for example, Southern Artery at C Street, McGrath Highway at Southern Artery, Newport at Beale, these are places that never had emergency preemption of any kind, ever. Um, so this, this technology really will be a game changer, I think, for a city like ours that has you know, 50,000 cars a day in some cases going through some of these intersections. And these really are some of the largest deployments that you'll see of technology like this um, anywhere in the Commonwealth, really anywhere in the region. So last year, uh, the city CIP, we approved, uh, the council approved, and we thank you for your approval of our project at Adams at uh, Newport. That will be a complete intersection overhaul with new mast arms, uh, new wiring, new cabinets, et cetera. We aim to complete that project this year, this calendar year. We ordered a new bucket truck. We anticipate that to be delivered this year. And uh, lastly, the North Quincy Decorative Streetlight Project is another project that would replace all of the decorative streetlights in North Quincy. We anticipate completing that this year as well. Um, certainly the state has been incredibly active here in Quincy. Um, everybody knows it. Sometimes I feel like we're under siege from all the different works and all the different corners of the, seat of the city. These are good projects. They're difficult, and I thank all the people who are impacted by them every day for their patience. Um, the Robertson Street Bridge Project, we've entered a phase, I would say, Council Pamucci, Council Mahoney, where it's a little bit easier to deal with that right now than it was certainly in the first phase, which is positive. Um, the General's Bridge is nearly 50% complete. Quincy Shore Drive at C Street, again, is roughly 50% complete. These are projects that, you know, I hope to see substantial completion by the end of the calendar year. Um, C Street Phase 2, I've talked to Council McCarthy about that. That's at the 25% uh, design phase. We had a spirited hearing about that a few weeks ago. 
and uh, certainly look forward to getting that design advanced. Southern Artery at Broad Street, um, which is a very, very critical corridor and a corridor where we've had significant um, history of pedestrian incidents is one that is at the pre-25% design phase, but one where we believe, certainly Allie believes, and I believe that the improvements we see will have really fundamental structural improvements on some of those issues we've seen far too many times in a place like that. So it's sort of a general topic here, and I want to get specifically into um, some of the pedestrian functionality and the speed reduction. Um, we're trying to be sensitive and trying to be uh, equitable across the entire city. There are a number of projects uh, in the works. I think we're going to have a good year with our bike lane infrastructure in parts of North Quincy and parts of Southwest Quincy, along Adams Street, along Quarry Street. I think we're going to see some really good improvements there. Um, I heard Quarry Street mentioned earlier by Councilor Mahoney relative to the four lane cross section. Um, that's one where we're gonna see a reduction actually in the amount of lanes. We're gonna give some of that space back to bikes, but ultimately it's gonna be a real traffic calming measure. That was funded by the Complete Streets Initiative. Um, so we're excited about that project uh, moving forward this year. And through Allie's leadership and through my engineering team, who's done a marvelous job, you know, we've looked at a lot of different um, places where we could add crosswalks, where we could evaluate things like that working closely with the ward councilors. I know I've worked with Councilor Kane on a few different occasions um, where we can evaluate, do we need more? Do we need to do more? Do we need to provide more? Do we need to provide something where nothing has ever existed? Um, so there's a listing here of some projects that were kind of either we've completed in the case of Beale Street at Old Colony Ave, or we anticipate building or designing this year. And what we try to do in all of these is evaluate the need for it evaluate the speed conditions, evaluate the site distance, evaluate all those factors in determining what needs to happen. And unfortunately, a lot of folks ask, they think you can just go out and paint something, you need to do a little bit more work, curb work, et cetera, um, to, to make projects like that come to fruition. And relative to pedestrian infrastructure, um, one of the things that sort of we've always relied on is sort of passive recognition of a pedestrian's presence. Um, we are of the belief in our department that that is not nearly adequate enough for a city like ours. When you have this many vehicles, when you have this many pedestrians, when you have all of the activity we have, young people, old people, everyone in between, different mobility levels, um, it's really important that we look at these corridors. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means of streets that we're talking about. What we aim to do over the last year, we've installed somewhere in the neighborhood about a dozen um, push button activated pedestrian crossings. We want to do at least another dozen this year. I believe we are going to be able to secure a little bit of the TMC funding um, that the city got from the state in order to fund some of those sort of complete streets design elements. We want to focus in on streets that have, you know, vehicle totals north of 10,000 a day, known speeding issues, known connectivity to schools, known, known connectivity to parks or to transit. And, and I think that these push button activated uh, products are really, really helpful for people because it makes the vehicle, the driver aware of your presence, especially times a year like this when it is very difficult to see people, um, you know, when it gets dark so early. I mentioned some of the bikes uh, infrastructure that we're talking about um, doing. We also wanna, where we're not installing lanes, we wanna be sensitive to providing people with wayfinding signage to direct people on sort of the easiest, safest route to get to some of these transit stations. If you think of something like Wallison Station, driving down Beale Street can be very daunting, but going on one of the parallel streets to Beale Street that gets you over maybe to Brook Street can be a lot less intimidating for people. And it's more of a welcoming thing, especially for folks who aren't from here, aren't as familiar with um, some of that as well. We're in the process of uh, finalizing the installation of eight Speed feedback signs. Um, speed feedback signs are really helpful in trying to achieve traffic calming. Um, those eight are already bought and paid for. We're waiting for the products to come in. I would say over the next you know, year and moving forward, we aim to install a number more of those. We think that those are, uh, it's too, it, you know, we're, we're due. We're overdue for some of those installations. And then we have some additional projects that um, we've been working on, uh, Newport and Beale. Signal coordination, once the T got off of that intersection, we were able to coordinate Newport Beale and Newport Brook. Um, it handles 
you know, in a given day, somewhere north of 30,000 cars a day. So it's not as if you make traffic go away. There's no magic wand for that. But we have coordinated those intersections so you're not seeing that sort of gridlock queuing that we had before. Copeland Common West, um, we're working with Councilor Pambucci on achieving something over there relative to coordination. Um, Hancock Beale and Hancock Elm, these are two intersections that are very close to each other. We've never had the ability to coordinate them in the past. We do have that ability, and Allie's going to be working on getting a plan like that implemented. Um, and then Bergen Center, um, looking at a, uh, a replacement of all the signals overhead there. I'd also add that you know we try to work with the DPW. We try to work with the planning department to identify any opportunity where other funding could come in and try to help us um, you know, help find a funding source other than the taxpayer to, to make some of these improvements. So Mr. Fatsis has been wonderful to work with on that front. I know Elliot's has worked closely with Jim's team. And um, you know, I, I look at it as nothing but a positive if we can achieve more contributions like that. Um, so with that, I would uh, gladly open it up to any questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Council McCarthy. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, Mr. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Cassandra. <laughs> Not yet, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll see you in the morning. Uh, Chris, uh, I want to reiterate uh, Councillor Kane's comments earlier. Uh, you know, um, as, as ward councillors, I mean, we, we, we really all over you guys, uh, probably a lot more than the uh, large with the calls. And um, um, you've done a tremendous job. Uh, I know with me alone on small things in Ward 1, but uh, the Quincy Shore Drive uh, combination with DOT, um, which is a battle in itself only because it's probably the busiest intersection in the morning coming out of House Neck to try to dance around and get it done. Uh, and, and you've done a great job working with them along with a lot of the other folks in the city. Um, and then to, uh, to be able to give me the time um, to talk uh, about phase two on C Street, which will run from Quincy Shore Drive all the way down to Palmer, which is gonna start right up uh, pretty fast. There's gonna be another uh, um, you know, very large project for Ward 1, but uh, uh, you've been there uh, uh, for me uh, whenever we have any of our early morning uh, uh, visits in regards to going over everything and, and done a tremendous job. Um, and again, those those locations, Quincy Shore Drive, you talk a little bit about Broad Street um, with Fratelli's there, which we know is a tough intersection, um, along with C Street alone. So um, I want to thank you uh, and Allie and Ed and the whole team uh, for uh, really taking a, a, big, a, a big bucket list that I had for Ward 1 and, and knocking it down to uh, a few items now, uh, uh, which is great. So. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks, that, Chris. And, uh, and thank you to all the councils, really, too, for all the input that we receive. It's, it's incredibly helpful for us to guide our steps. So I, I thank Yeah, you. you took this on a couple of years ago when you came into the spot, uh, you know, into the job, and, and you've really uh, got your arms around it in regards to, I think, uh, um, all the modernization, all the project you just talked about, and uh, and any relationship with the DOT and a lot of projects that, uh, can it get frustrating, uh, you know, you want to uh, get it done as quick as possible, and it doesn't always happen that way. And uh, folks get impatient, uh, and then, uh, as Councillor Palmucci said, when, it, the, when, the, when the final uh, uh, bell has uh, gone off, uh, you have it for uh, 50 years or so, and it's a tremendous uh, improvement. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council McCarthy. Councillor Bono? Uh, thank you, Madam um, President. Um, Chris, thank you for coming in tonight. Um, I know how you feel. Two weeks of the flu, and then today we find out one of the boys has uh, double ear infection. Oh, so God bless you. We get a mess over there just like you. So I know how you feel. <laughs> a revolving table. Anyways, um, <laughs> thank you for this presentation. I did get this a little earlier. got a chance to look at it online. Um, uh, just a little bit. I watch a lot of documentaries on um, China and the artificial intelligence, I guess I would call it, I, I, A, AI, facial recognition. Is it legal here in the United States to do that? I mean, when you're talking about all these people crossing these intersections, crossing 
lights and then also cars. What is it legally that can you, are you looking at license plates? No, no, we, we can't, the, the camera technology we have can't see it, doesn't look for it. We, it's, is what you can see in our camera would be, you know, a white car or a red car or an SUV okay. versus this. There's no identification of any sort relative to individuals. There's, there's no data collection of any kind. There's okay. no data selling of any kind. It's really, um, you know, th it's a purpose of identifying who's there in the intersection. That's, that's the entire purpose of it. Uh, the reason why I ask this is we, I get tons of calls with people going down one ways, people going down do not enters at certain times. And it just if you have the stuff in motion, how can you, you can monitor it better. Is that, is that correct? Are you able to see people go down a one-way street? We, if, if we had a camera positioned at an intersection where something like that were illegal, then yes, yes, we could. Generally speaking, I think a lot of the things you're talking about are at unsignalized intersections. So in those cases, we don't have any, you know, our, my department isn't looking at anything like that. Okay. We're focused in on vehicle activations and so sure. forth at those intersections. I understand. It's just, it's just we, as an at-large counselor, I get, a, get pockets throughout the city where I get a, a swarm of calls for certain people in certain neighborhoods that they're cutting through again. They're doing this again. And it's different times of the year it happens. We had some type of data collected. We could maybe mitigate it and, you know, allow police officers to go on to the certain sites and do more studies and, stuff. and I think to that point you know there's a good amount of data sharing between my department when we do collect other types of data again not direct license plate that sort of thing but if we collect data remotely at a place like that we can say hey look you know there's supposed to be a 7 to 9 a.m. restriction and we counted 47 okay. cars do it let's let's see if you guys can schedule some of that periodic enforcement so you know there's a good give and take I would say between the police and us to both analyze these things and then share the information with each other. I think that's gonna be really helpful going forward, Chris. I mean, we, we are a cut through city. This traffic is still there. And, but I, I, I talk to people, I say, listen, what community, what municipality doesn't go through this? Everybody's going through the same problems we're going through with the traffic concerns. Sure. So <clears throat> what can we do to mitigate and make it more safety? More, you know, safety is number one. Um, you know, we've had, People getting hit, obviously. We ha you said 6,000 people are going through a certain intersection daily? Right out here. You know, and that's just the 6, people. 6,000 people walking on foot? Right. In one day? In one day. Wow, that's yep. a lot. Yep. I mean, if you think about it, you know, every 15 days, I guess, maybe my math is wrong, the entire population of the city of Quincy crosses the street right there. You know, if you think of it that way, it's, it's, it's amazing, really. Well, it's, it's glad we have the proper infrastructure in place when we did did this all over because there would be a lot more accidents, people getting hit. Um, are you tracking the areas of where we're having uh, accidents as oh, well? Absolutely. absolutely. Um, are, you, are you seeing increases, decreases in certain areas where we've paved certain areas or we've made the stoplight look more presentable where you could see it? Or is there any blind? I, I know we talked about a blind spot over um, by the mobile station. Mm -hmm. And I think you... It, you would mitigate it, you fixed it, and do, are you seeing any of those across the city? The, the biggest trend without question historically, and this, this is a, there's a reason why it's subject to so much state funding, is over at Broad Street. Broad Street. You know, that is an area yeah. where um, there's no amount of sort of signalization. It's not a problem with the traffic signals. It's a problem sort of with the fundamental design of the roadway. So when you look at a project potentially getting done there, um, sure, you'll get new signal equipment, but you'll get a whole lot more. I mean, you'll get a, a comprehensive design, a reimagining kind of the right of way to make some of the moves that are very dangerous that people and pedestrians make to make it make more sense for people, to make it make more sense for pedestrians. Um, and then, you know, also, too, I mean, there needs to be a level of education and outreach with us. And I think, you know, some of the constituents who are over there crossing the street every day to increase pedestrian awareness of, you know, why... There, why isn't there a crosswalk there? Well, there isn't one there because it's not safe for you to be there in the mm -hmm. first place. So, you know, we're trying to make inroads on doing a little bit of a limited education program, um, you know, with Father Bill's place, Mainspring, um, because, you know, we do see some trends. We do see some trends about where the incidents occur. And, um, you know, obviously any time like that where you do see a trend, you, you need to look at the root cause and figure out a solution. In this case, it's a very expensive, very time-consuming one. 
but certainly one that will yield, I think, major, major benefits for the whole city. Um, but obviously, everybody uses that intersection every day. Do you think that's the biggest um, traffic um, congestion in the entire city? Right, particularly it's right there? It's the busiest there? intersection, without a doubt, and it has the longest history of pedestrian incidents, certainly. It's, it's definitely a challenging area. I got to go through it every single day, um, going in and out of where I live. I live right down the street from there. But are you also assisting the fact that over the Fall River Bridge, we're getting traffic from Weymouth and Hingham sure. and all these other going over the bridge? And Is that particularly the reason why you think it's there? I wouldn't attribute the pedestrian issues to that per se. Um, certainly the volumes you see, you know, we know that you're talking thousands of vehicles entering the city every day from these different locations. So um, our position close to Boston and close to Weymouth and everybody else, it, it's inevitable that it's gonna be here. Um, what our goal is on that front is to make the main lines as functional as they possibly can be so that you eliminate the desire to do some of that cutting through some of the neighborhoods. I think a project like Quincy Shore Drive and C Street's a perfect example of one that once it's done, in addition to some of the things that we've done with our stuff, that that intersection will function so much better and really remove the incentive for cutting through parts of Marymount. Um, and anywhere else where we can do something like that, you know, perhaps it's working closely with DCR along Furnacebrook Parkway, we're having those conversations and we're trying to make inroads on getting those things accomplished. I think the new public safety headquarters moving forward and relocating the father bills on the other side and then using the back road um, through the Ford dealership there area would mitigate a lot of that foot traffic that's going across. Any, anything there. we can do to get pedestrians to a signal, to a safe place to cross yeah. is, is without question an improvement. <clears throat> I, I thank you, Chris. I mean, this is the data that we needed. We needed someone like yourself in the position to 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 let us know what <coughs> overseeing this and the oversight of it all. I appreciate you coming in tonight. Thank you. And we'll, we'll work on this. And we'll tackle the little areas and po pockets throughout the city as we continue. Indeed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Bonham. Councilor Kroll. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Through you, um, Chris, how you doing? Brian, how are you, Councilor? Another... Um, you know, another guy that I enjoy dealing with, you just, you know, you're on top of stuff, you're responsive. I think uh, your creativity and willingness to think outside of the box, uh, particularly given the, um, you know, the, the increased cars on the road, right? I mean, there's, there's kind of no way around that. So, um, you know, we've had certainly some discussions and floated some ideas to various streets throughout Ward 2 on how we can sort of take what we have and hopefully improve it. I know we're kind of going through an exercise right now over on Edward Street, which I've you know started to field uh, some real time feedback as as I remind folks, you know I work closely with the traffic department who are, who are the experts and um, but there's there's nobody that knows the neighborhood better than the people that live there. so I just want to thank you for taking the time. It was funny. I'm trying to think where I was the other day, but those uh, digital speed signs. I've been doing a lot of driving lately, um, and it may have been Braintree, and the sign was, whatever it was, 25 miles an hour, I think was the posted speed limit, so then it kind of tracked where you were, and right as you got, you got close, <laughs> it turned into a, uh, a smiley face emoticon. I'm that, not crazy about the smiley face. Well, I don't I want just, anyone to get distracted. But it definitely, and hit definitely anybody. caught my attention. <laughs> but it was almost like, uh, hey, you know, you're doing the right thing and yeah. travel on. But uh, I would assume that when you talk about some of that digital implementation, that's, I'm, I'm going to say, sans the smiley face. Exactly. Yeah, the same type of technology. I think we'll go no smiley face here in Quincy. Perhaps we could give it a, a, a trial somewhere. Maybe but a um, it's, we're overdue. Thumbs up. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Maybe we can work yeah. on that. Maybe they're programmable. Something more subtle. Yeah. Um, but that's sort of the direction that we're, we're going in. It is. And, and again, I think we look at when we collect speed data, what we kind of know is that there are a lot of roads where 25 seems fast, even though, you know, it's the prima facie speed limit. We have roads, though, where we know we have a speeding issue. You know, you look at Independence Avenue, for example. We know there's a problem over there. Even Sumner Street. Sure, exactly. Which I mean, is crazy when you consider the bend in that road. But Yeah, to see numbers in the 50s and 60s there literally is, is, is awful, really. You know, so we want to put that in. That we're, we're bought and paid for. That's going to go in. Um, and we, we want to work closely with all the ward councilors on any of those items. Because if we determine there's a problem, if we determine... You know, some of the other factors we need, 
something like this, you know, it doesn't cost an enormous amount of money, but it really shows people a visual representation of the work we do. And uh, I think it's very well received and really not uh, an imposition on anybody to have it on the street either. Right. No, and I, I don't know about the, uh, the imposition, but I, I haven't heard any feedback as of yet. Um, and we've done some other things together that, uh, that have corrected some behaviors, um, you know, in the area. I think uh, one of the things that I was kind of contemplating it isn't really on the slide deck, but while I have you here and also our friends at Quincy Access Television, because I get a lot of inquiries about it because mm -hmm. it's either a high crash zone or a high frequency of, you know, pedestrian accidents is uh, Quincy Avenue. Could you just give maybe like a 30 second overview as to the complexities? Because, I mean, what people will say is, well, you know, maybe you could just put a, a crosswalk at the at the Olindy's bowling alley. But my understanding was just the way that the road shaped and you had actually pointed out something that kind of um, really blew my mind as to how you would actually correct that problem, which is essentially shaving off the slope on Quincy Ave, which is probably not doable, but can you just talk a little bit about that road? Because sure. um, I look you know, further down the street over at the Can Man, we've identified a conceptual project that we've discussed a little bit with you. Hopefully we can sort of ding and dong some funding over there to get something like that done. As you come up to a road like Faxon Park Road, the difficulty with a situation like that is, you know, it's fundamentally unsafe to cross at Olindy's. That's why we don't have a crosswalk there. There's no way of making it safe short of a full-blown signal. Um, and that then gets into the matter of, okay, is it warranted? Is it the right decision to make? Can you justify doing it? So a full signal warrant and analysis would have to be done over there. That information would really need to be presented probably to the DOT at the state level. Um, and then, you know, you're talking about a, a very expensive project. You know, a, a, I don't know if it would approach seven figures, but it would be a substantial, substantial lift to do something like that, you know, if it's warranted. Obviously, when you have an incident like happened, like happened not too long ago, like has happened in the past, um, you know, anything really should be on the table to analyze. And that's something that I'm working with Ali on to try to identify, is it warranted? Is it the right thing to do over there? Um, because it is, it's a, known, it's a known issue. But alternatively, I had spent earlier on in my career, I'd say, geez, the better part of an hour and a half to two hours up there with uh, Jack Gillen, literally counting cars and walking up and down Quincy Avenue to see if we could come up with some you know, pragmatic solution. But the challenge was always the sight distance. So when you're coming over Quincy Ave heading north towards Boston, there's not enough braking distance uh, to kind of bring you, you know, to your point, in a pedestrian format where you have a crosswalk and maybe even those illuminated um, signs, still not sure if that would work. So, I mean, it's, that's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky situation. It is, it is. And like I said, I think that, you know, further analysis about whether or not a signal would be warranted is a good step to take. Um, and then from there, you know, it really, there's a conversation relative to execution, relative to funding and all that. Yeah. I mean, I know it's not, you know, a unique situation, you know, we experience this throughout the city, but uh, the reality is we're, we're growing as a city. There's more people, more people, more cars, um, you know, and that's so, again, I tip my hat to you. I think you have one of the mo more difficult jobs in the city managing, um, you know, <laughs> increases you. Yep. in everything, particularly, you know, vehicular traffic. So, um, you know, thank you for what you do. I appreciate and it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Councilor Carl. Council Mahoney. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chris. How are Hi. you? Fine. How are you? So um, I, thank you very much for coming out tonight. I'm going to be, I probably will be a little bit all over. So one of the things that's not in here, so I know one of the things that you do too is um, you issue tickets, right? Um, where do we stand on the ticket issuing and collection of those tickets? Are we, I is this part of your, this part of oh, sure. It's okay I, if you don't have it. If you don't have it with you tonight, I can you can send get it that, to you. I can get that yeah. information. So you, that's sure. part of like, that's a, I mean, that's, we added people to your budget to do that. And my guess is that you probably have, that, that you're very busy, they're, they're, they're very busy, and that you're probably issuing lots and lots of tickets, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely, every day. Yep. Yep. And then also, I noticed, and this is not in your presentation either, in the paper, I noticed that the courts are going to start charging, the courthouse is going to start charging, and, and are we going to, the city of Quincy is going to actually monitor that? Is that what's happening? We uh, signed a, an intermunicipal agreement with the county where we are going to provide for enforcement um, over there to the county. 
Um, you know, day one of it, I was over there earlier today, I'd say, you know, so far so good. I think yeah. people want to comply. Right. They want to pay, they want to display their tag. Yeah. I think things will go pretty well over there and we'll have a good relationship with the county to make sure our enforcement is targeted and not burdensome to our staff. Yeah, my concern with that is obviously, I mean, I understand, I understand the reason why they were very flexible with us with the free parking. Um, but my concern is that we have a limited amount of people that you have on your staff that's supposed to be ticketing around the city of Quincy and to utilize any of our, our you know, any of your manpower to do that means it's not being done in the city where we can collect the revenues because the revenues that would be collected would not come to the city of Quincy. They, if will. They, they will come they to will, the, okay. Yeah. So, so I, I, thought, I might've read that wrong then because I thought that it was that they wouldn't come. It would go to Norfolk. It would go to the Norfolk. So the, the revenue they collect in their machines goes to the county. The okay. revenue we issue in tickets. That's fine. So, yep. so, as we're, so, so then the tickets will be, if they're, if they're in violation, the tickets will be what? At, $25. $25. So that $25 you're issuing the ticket will come to the city of Quincy. Exactly. Okay. So I definitely read that backwards. Yep. So I just, I, 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 I was asking my colleagues next to me if they remembered. I had to look it up on my phone, but I didn't get to read the full article. Um, okay. So, so just, I mean, I, I appreciate the presentation. I'm going to say this again. So when I, I guess, I, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you got this presentation over to us ahead of time. It's, it's far more helpful to have that. Um, so the video detection upgrades, you said you have 55 that are currently being utilized that you can monitor from your desk and you can change patterns of traffic throughout the city. What are the highest, what, what, and you said there were eight that, were, that you were monitoring today. What would you say were the highest, if you give the intersections, could you repeat them to me? The, the highest that I, from that January 22nd case study there, brief was Bergen and Hannon, 44,000 cars a day over there. And then after that, McGrath at Southern Artery handled um, 41,000 cars a day. Southern Ottery at Washington Street was 39,000 cars a day. So, you know, our busiest intersections are typically are at they typically, 40. Yeah, they typically during rush hour or during, are they all day long? Or it's it's all day long. So, you know, at Bergen at Hannon, for example, you had almost 3,000 cars in the morning and almost 3,500 cars in the evening, peak, just one peak hour. Right. So in the morning peak hour, almost 3,000 cars. In the evening peak hour, 3,500 cars. Those would be helpful too if we could see those types of things sure. too. And then where are the others? So you have 55 and then I think you provided those to us before. Where maybe are the other ones? Is there one down in North Quincy or is there? Like, so you know? we have uh, detection sort of spread out throughout the entire city. We have uh, video detection at uh, the McDonald's, the new intersection. And as you kind of work your way down Hancock Street, mm -hmm. we have video detection at each intersection through um, Hayward Street. Mm -hmm. Then we have recently installed video detection at um, Hancock and Beale, Hancock and Elm. As you come into Quincy Center, again, all those intersections that from basically Hancock, Adams, Dimmick, all the way down to Quincy Ave at Scammell Street, you have video detection the entire way down. Yeah, Hancock and Adams and Dimmick, that's another one that if you get stuck at that light when it's red, it takes you forever to go through. But mm -hmm. I know what you're, so, so an example for that for anybody that's listening at home, if you're monitoring, monitoring that and, and you're seeing a backup that's happening in certain directions, you're able to switch it so that the lights will move the traffic a little bit. We can True. do that, and our system intuitively does it as well. Your system is intuitively yep. does it as well. Okay, because sometimes if you get stuck at that light, that's a that's a. There's a lot going on light. there. You know, I, there's, <laughs> oh no, there's, I know. There's a lot going on. There's a few things I'd like to do to potentially re envision how we handle it. Right now, it's one giant intersection: mm -hmm. Hancock, Adams, Dimmick, and the MBTA station, and all the side streets. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that that's the most effective way of managing traffic. So we have a concept. It's also three lights right in a row. So you have exactly. all that corner and then you get to the next. You get about, even if you were able to, um, and I know they're all connected, but you can only get the traffic to flow so much because you're going to get stuck at the next light. And, and if a pedestrian is trying to cross, then it changes the probably exactly. the pattern of exactly. that, correct? Um, so I, I, do, I do see those challenges, and I do think that the, the technology is great that we have that, and you're able to, to show that. I think it would be helpful for us at the council to be able to see some of those reports and then dive a little bit deeper to understand a little bit more. And you said you're gonna, and your hope is to change it from 55 to a, get up to an additional 70 total. To, have, to be able to remotely um, monitor 70. The next kind of big corridor that we want to focus in on is Newport Ave north of Brook. Um, so that would incorporate the big office parks off of Newport Ave, mm -hmm. um, Newport at Holbrook, um, Newport at uh, Hobart as well. So kind of that's the last leg where we really don't have much yeah. in terms of And that's another area that's incredibly dangerous, um, incredibly dangerous because of um, just the T traffic coming out and the 
businesses and people just don't have any patience with anybody that's over there. So just to back up, just to, not too many further, I just want to have one other question. So one of the things I do notice, and I, you know, I, I've, I'm a frequent MBTA user and I take it from Wollaston. I've taken it, I take it from Wollaston. You know, I, don't, I don't go to Adams, but you know, Quincy Center, Wollaston and, and North Quincy. Um, North Quincy, um, if I'm if I'm commuting with my daughter, um, North Quincy, when you're walking across the street, I notice the lights on, on um, where they're doing the development. Sometimes the lights, I don't know if it's something that is controlled by you, if that's one of the lights that's controlled by you or if it's controlled somehow, it will go off. And I've got in touch with you to tell you and you've had it right back on. It is so dangerous because, you know, I watch the kids kind of maneuver across the street because I'm trying to go the opposite way to get to the train station. They're coming across the street to go to school. And to watch that in the morning, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, it's terrifying. And just because I know it's a dangerous street, I mean, we had a fatality on that street, but um, is there, with the T doing all the work over there, is there any plans to upgrade that particular area of the city? The one um, project that I think will make a huge difference is over at Homes, mm -hmm. Homes at West Guantanamo. Currently yeah. there's a crosswalk and there's a, you know, we have a beacon in the middle of the street, yep. it's not even a beacon. Um, but that's going like to get a cone it. thing. Yeah, it, more or less. You know, it's it's something. Um, yeah, no, I know. Well, it's just that whole area is very dangerous, and I just want to bring it up because it's just something that I yeah I I, I, I have to hold my breath every day when I watch it. And part of it is is there's a lot going on, right? There's the development that's going on. People trying to get to work, trying to get to school, just trying to. Sure, yeah, and putting any you know, I think that project will be sort of the one glaring difference from the layout right now. Mm -hmm. um, versus what you'll see in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. um, I think generally speaking, we have a number of signals over there mm -hmm. to your point earlier, and, yep. and that was invaluable that you called that day. Um, making sure if we have folks over there working in an area like that, that yeah. when they leave it, yeah. that it is working properly and they can call my staff any hour of the day and we will correct something like that because it is it's, you know, that well, so th that's definitely an accident waiting to happen. I was concerned that day because it's just, I, but, but the problem is, is that I'm not always in this, you know, like you want people to know that, like, is there a, a number that you have in the site or anything that you it just, it's Police just non emergency four seven nine one two one two. If you yeah. see anything like that would mm -hmm. be the best thing to do. Yeah. And they'll get my, you know, they'll, we, we work with them all the time. Yeah. Cause oftentimes people don't even think about it. They just, you know, and cause certainly the kids that are crossing the street aren't going to think about it. And, you know, for the most part, they have to, and the street I'm talking about is actually on, on um, Hancock when they're trying to get across from the T by the McDonald's to the D'Angelo's. That is, it's a, it's a highway, um, first of all. So if the light's not working, it's just, it's just, people just speed up. It's not like they, it's not like they're slowing down. They're just speeding up and it's, it's just, um, it's painful. So, and I don't know if it has anything to do with the development. Does development have anything to do with it? They can shut it off. Can they, they don't, they can't knock you offline, can they? I'm just curious. There are times when putting it in flash yeah. is more beneficial for the police detail. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of a manual operation. Mm -hmm. The problem with a manual operation is if you don't put it back on, yeah. put it back on you know, you're, you're left with, a, with, a, with some trouble. So yeah. The reason why I thought it might have something to do with the development is because it was when they were bringing in some of the heavy pieces and the trucks were coming in to pull them in, and they seemed like they kind of had control of the street, but it was at a time that was just not ideal. Yep. So... Um, and it's, I don't think it's ever ideal over there because the, that people use the, the, it's not just students. It's also, oh, sure. you know, it's, it's everybody. Um, then the other area is down by Quincy short that, actually, not, I'm going to skip that. I'm just going to go on to the, to the list here. So when I'm looking at the city CIP monies and, um, for just out of curiosity, I can't remember. I know I asked this during the budget. You're saying that the new bucket truck that's coming this year, is that, do you already have a bucket truck? Is it a replacement? How many bucket trucks do you have? We have start? two bucket trucks. Um, one of the bucket trucks we have for one of our crews is, is in excellent condition. The other bucket truck, you know, I think it was not a great year for the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think it's 12 years old, which is a decent run for a truck that gets kind of beat up like it does. This will replace that one. We will keep the other one. Um, you know, there's really no, we really can't get rid of it anyways, but um, it does have some utility as a backup backup. You know, for us. So you'll have three in total in your department. Correct. Yeah, two really, two two front line and one backup. And who dri who who utilizes those? Who drives those? Do you so we have five electricians who work for us. Um, an electrician is sort of you know the point person on each one of those. Mm -hmm. um, we generally send our two man crews, um, and then we have you know engineering analysis and inspections and so forth and the fire alarm piece. Mm -hmm. So that our electricians are extremely extremely well utilized. Um, 
all day, every day, for sure. So it's the fire alarm piece. What would be some of the other examples of, of, of utilization for the, the trucks, just out of curiosity? Street light changes. Um, any so the, 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 um, the, the street lights, you know, the illuminated street lights, and then any work that we have on any of the mast arms, um, you know, installing cameras, fixing lights, mm -hmm. you name it, um, anything like that. Yep. So um, now moving down to the state managed roads. So I see that Robinson Street Bridge is 50% complete. And um, I think it is that now that we have the one side open, there's, it's, 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 it's moving along. Um, it's still, you know, it's amazing. That's, that's to me, it's just amazing that more things haven't happened. Yale doesn't be, seem to be something people know how to do anymore. I don't know <laughs> if they teach that in driver's ed. Um, <laughs> um, it's interesting, though, because when my, I have my 17-year-old drive, she is like, terrified to go over the bridge now because she's like they don't stop i'm like they do he's you know it's a little bit of chicken but it's okay the question that i have too and i think we talked about this a little bit and i council uh, councilor de bona brought it up is you know the cut through traffic and some of that area because it was reversed before we still have cut through traffic that's coming up during the evening hours but i actually think it's actually been better coming off the highway at nighttime now it's coming through the neighborhood in the morning and going up governor's road and it's very severe. So it just seems like I think the, think the bridge has slowed down the traffic the other way because there's a lot of traffic coming that way, which has been a plus. Um, but the opposite direction is um, very challenging. I know this is something that gets brought up all the time. The city of Quincy could make a mint of money if because you're not supposed to be cutting through those roads if you had details to actually collect those tickets and fines because the only way you deter people is by an enforcement. And that's just going to be a statement, the blank statement. But I, I, you agree with me, and I think it's harder to do than, than you know. I mean, I, I think the police have an incredibly difficult job mm -hmm. with respect to that um, because of the way that some of those ordinances are written. But mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, the only way to train people in that case, they're not going to do it by their own goodness. They're going to do it because of enforcement. Yeah. Well, you know, we can put up signs that say do not enter, and, and we can put up signs that say if we don't actually enforce it, then, you know, it doesn't matter. Your cut through traffic is going to do it because it's going to get them there 10 minutes faster to work. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get to their end result 10 minutes faster. And unless you deter them, and the way you deter people is in their pocket. Because any time that somebody has to pay for something or even get a, you know, a warning doesn't do it, though. A ticket does. They have to go through the hassle of actually having to, you know, go and, and defend it. They'll... They'll, they won't go that way again. Um, and I know what happens in other communities because I've I've um, called and talked to them and I've actually watched it happen. And it's it's just in, in particular areas and they actually can make good money. I mean, the, that that's something to consider. Um, the general bridge is fifty percent complete. I'm a little. Can you educate me? Five Minute Street Bridge. No, I know that's I know what the bridge is, but it, it doesn't seem like it's even had the crossover yet. So it's fifty percent complete. That seems so. The the lion's share of the work on that has been building the abutments, um, and I, I you know I'm familiar with what they're doing, but the engineering piece of it, I wouldn't want to get wouldn't want to comment on it too too heavily because I'm just not as familiar with that. But the huge, huge effort to get the abutments in place on either side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, so they had a lot of work that they had to do on the uh, Burger King side of that, yep. which you know was integral in getting the project done. That was kind of phase one. Right now, they're working on both sides of the tracks to get the abutments ready. And I know that their plan is to lay the bridge deck, I think in the, sp in the spring? spring, spring, this summer. Is being, this is being, no, it's being overseen by you, but man, is it, it's a- is, DOT it's, project. It's, DOT, DOT funded, DOT, DOT built. Um, the city does have oversight. Mr. Trayman Tozzi is involved. Um, you know, we're working with the company on a, on a regular basis um, to, to make sure that the traffic is moving as best we can. Mm -hmm. Obviously, again, I mentioned 44,000 cars a day. When you restrict that capacity in half, obviously there's ramifications to it. Mm -hmm. And then the C Street phase two, that's the, that's the one that um, Councillor McCarthy just had a meeting and... Um, some major concerns came up there with the regards to, um, and I realized that to be able to get the complete street funding, that you have to have the bike paths. The bike paths are a very big concern. People want them, but it's a, so when do we think we'll have those designs back? Uh, just quickly before you answer that question, we just have a few seconds left. And so, yeah. Councilor, it's okay, I just want to honor the rule and allow anybody else to have an opportunity to speak. Um, and then we can come back to that question. If we could just put a pin in it, Chris, sure. if that's okay. Um, I don't want to rush your answer oh, no, on that. No so, problem, no problem. Thanks. I'll be um, concise. Um, thank I, 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 oh, sorry. You know, I'm going to have you hold it just so that oh, you right, could put right. a pin in that. And if anybody else has any other questions, hmm? no? 
Okay, we'll get right back to it then. Please continue. Oh, sure. Um, I, I think we're in the process. We're going to actually have a meeting tomorrow where we're going to, you know, confer kind of with the city crew about what we want to see out of this. The, um, I believe it's funded in calendar year 2022. 2022 is for the, the ac execution of the project. So I think in a project like this where it is pretty involved with drainage and so forth, um, they'll need a, a substantial amount of time. You won't see this go to bid until next year, 2021. Mm -hmm. um, but the design itself and 100% design hearing, I'm not sure if it, it's realistic to think that that would happen before the end of the calendar year. Um, but you're not two years away from that meeting either. I was just curious because I know that they were they were filling up. So just fast forwarding towards the end of your presentation, one of the things, so I know that we were talking about some of the um, enhanced um, features like the, like over at Wallace and T Station, the crosswalk that you, that was put in the beacon. Uh, what, what is that? What, what would that be considered? It's a that? rectangular rapid flashing beacon. That's what that's called. So it's push button activated. Um, and it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's excellent in terms of how responsive it is to the. So vehicle. that would be the enhanced driver awareness of pedestrian presence. Is that exactly? Underneath those? And how many of those do we have around the city? Because I've seen a few. Like you have one over by Lincoln Hampton. We have a couple now. of different projects. A couple of different products. Um, we're at I want to say ten, uh -huh. and I think that we really need to be at a much higher number. We're going to hit the gas pedal on that in a big way because they make a big difference. They make how expensive a big difference. are those? Are those something that's in it? That's we're going to hopefully if you bought one, let's call it eight thousand bucks, give or take, and then you have to install it. Um, I think we're going to achieve better pricing on those by buying in bulk. Oh, yep. So the one thing, and I, and the, the, so I'm going to just so so the Wallston one. I, that's another one that I noticed is that people are just not either the traffic flow isn't paying attention or people aren't using it correctly. So I'm not sure how we can help educate the public on that because it's you know it's a good use. It's it's, it's definitely in the right place because you couldn't have a street light because of the way that area works and the, definitely the island is a huge benefit. Um, however, it's still one of those things that it, it's, it's a hold your breath kind of moment. Traffic just doesn't want to change. It's too bad that you can't insist that if people coming out of that street don't take a left and go up to Hancock and say it can only take a right. People won't like that. But um, it's, it's just that challenge to get across that area from, from, you know, by where the Coffee Break Cafe is. And I'm not suggesting that you should change. I'm just saying it's just a, I watch it in the morning and it's a definite challenge to watch people. Sure. Um, get across the street and also drive in that area because it's definitely, um, it's we, not common. We say <laughs> in our department a lot, you know, we're always trying to balance between convenience and safety. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, people, the convenience wins out for a lot of, for a lot of people. Um, we are going to continue to advocate for safety. We want to work closely, obviously, with the ward counselors on, on any potential changes that, that would be made um, because everyone is very sensitive to all of that, as they, as they should be. The difference there, too, is that when you did that, when they put the island there, now, is that something that the city of Quincy paid for, or is that something that the MBTA paid for because of the changes? We, the city, we paid for that. Yeah, it's too bad, because I would think that that was something the MBTA should have paid for. Um, their sidewalk is on the other side, too, so I think it's... <laughs> um, but the, the, the other thing that you have that happened over there, too, when you did that is the traffic that's coming up from Hancock to... Um, Newport uh, cuts through in the aisle. The, it goes down to one. I don't think people really know how to navigate that area. So you see people back up in that area and it just, it seems like it's gotten better, but it's another, the pat because the pattern goes from like two to one to two again. So it's, it's a little tricky. Um, would you agree that that's a, yeah, I, I think when all of that work was done late in the construction season last year, the payment markings are not what they need to be, mm -hmm. and they will be. Once the spring rolls around, we'll have the good, you know, epoxy product that we put down and so forth. I think it will eliminate some of that confusion. Um, you know, not nothing's perfect, but by having better payment markings on the crosswalk and everything else, I think it'll make a lot more intuitive sense to everybody using the roadway mm -hmm. um, once we get that taken care of. And then one other question is, down over by the Robert Street Bridge, too, you had one of the electric, electric um, stop signs and I got hit. What was that? The the, uh, the stop signs that kind of light up. Upton, the, I'm sorry. So, okay. Upton Street. Yep. Um, how many of those do we have around the city? And is that something that, that... We kind of experimented with those. And honestly, I think the difficult... The reason we put them in places like that was mm -hmm. because we had stop signs getting dinged or getting hit. Um, we thought that having those signs would prevent that. I think in some cases, the profile of the roadway is such that, you know, a big truck, for example... It's not malicious, perhaps it's careless, it is careless, 
yeah. um, those are getting hit. And you know, a normal stop sign costs like a hundred dollars, let's say, and those cost about two thousand dollars. Yeah, that one in particular was a you know it was I thought it was great that you had it there, but it, it only lasted so long. But that's also because the the way the state did the no trucks coming down, and then the trucks were coming down anyway, and it was just it's amazing the telephone pole is actually still there. Um, again, that's enforcement, <laughs> but that's not actually, that's not something that the city of Quincy is doing either. The last thing I'll say is, and I thank you very much, Chris, for coming, but one of the challenges that I have, and I know that we have a lot of cut through through traffic, but we also have um, a lot of um, development that's happening in the city too, and nothing frustrates me more than when I go to a planning board meeting and they say that it's not going to have impact, negative impact, negative impact, negative impact to traffic, and it never does. And I know it's a struggle because those are additional we say it isn't going to, and you might say, you know, we only need 100 spaces in this building, and you end up with 200 cars, but they're going someplace, and they're going onto the streets of Quincy, and it's a challenge that you have to deal with. Um, but I think we do have to be a little bit more realistic about those things, because we're really not that walkable, commutable city yet in, in the development, and we, if, if we want that to happen, it has to be close to the hubs of where the T stations are, and some of these developments that we're doing are really far away from that, to so say that they're even, it's, it's, it's just... It's just it's it's just not true when we're doing some of these developments, and I just really hope that you push back as a as department head because it impacts you and it makes it very difficult for you to be able to do your job. Your job's not easy, but at the same time, we have to be realistic too because the, we have real challenges in the city of Quincy, and it's not getting any better. And some of it is is some of it is that cut through traffic, but some of it is man made by the things and the decisions that we make here in the city of Quincy. So I'll always be pushing to make sure that that. Um, you know, when we have traffic studies that come in from our peer reviews that you're looking at those and saying, no, they don't make sense. Certainly. And, and, and Allie's putting those things through the ringer, no doubt. And, you know, what we also want to do is pursue, you know, when a project is going to be built, when we know it's going to be built, mm -hmm. what can we do? You know, if you're going to say, Mr. Developer, that this is all these people are going to walk to all these places, mm -hmm. how can you make the walking experience better? Right. You know, and that's something we're working closely with Mr. Fatsy's on. Yeah, I think Allie's it's doing a great job with that. I think it's well. really important that we start pushing back on those things because these developers are coming in and they're making millions of dollars off of the city of Quincy and the residents are the ones that are getting hurt and our neighborhoods are getting hurt. Um, and quite honestly, there are ways that we can work with them to make them more accountable for what's happening in our neighborhoods. I would say, you know, if I could, if I could, you know, do a time machine and go back, I would have made the MBTA maybe pay for your $8,000 crosswalk that was happening there because, you know, they didn't really do much for the city of Quincy other than cause, at the end of the day, the, the Walls and T station, we do have a, you know, we, we have handicap accessibility, but it's a, it's, the, what's been replaced by that is like a wet tea station that is extremely dangerous that they have to put salt on the inside of the, the tea station because it's always soaking wet in the tea station. So, um, and that's a state project. That's not a city project, but it's, 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 it's something that it impacted our community and we should, we should probably have better um, mitigation coming from them. So, but I appreciate the presentation that you brought forward tonight. I know I have, I always have questions and, and I do appreciate too, just like DPW, um, when I send you a text message, you are responsive right back to me. So, I do appreciate that very much. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you, Councillor. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for Chris? No. Okay. Just uh, off to, off of uh, Council Mahoney's point. I mean, the MBTA just continues to disappoint, which I don't think at this point any of us should be surprised about. Um, but you know, I would offer again our support, like we did to Shelley, to take full advantage of um, any support and help you can have from us to push back on them and make sure that they are. Um, helping with the mitigation because their work is far from over in the city and they've been here with a lot of empty promises for quite some time. So I do want to, I mean, I know you can rely on us. You've worked with us in the past, but I just want to push that point that, sure. you know, we're here to help and advocate for that work as well. So appreciate thank it. you for your time, Chris. You I appreciate it. it. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Uh, so just a quick point with the consent of the body, we are approaching um, rule 20, I'm sorry, rule no, where are we? 34? 24. Uh, where we're not to go past 11 p.m. for meetings. And I want to give both public buildings and the Parks Department enough time to present as well as give my colleagues enough time to ask questions. And so, again, with the consent of the body, I'd like to table those two departments to come back in front of us um, so we can have a thorough discussion for both of those departments. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Uh, that also gives us time to go through some housekeeping work that we have to do as well. So um, thank you all for that. So with that... Um, Madam Clerk, we're going to go now to the approval of previous meeting minutes. Um, do we have a motion to approve? Anybody, Anybody want to approve our last meeting minutes? Thank you, Councillor Failing. Do we have a second? second. Council McCarthy, Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Oh, well, I'm Wait, sorry, you don't need a roll for that. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, do we have communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers, and city boards? 
Um, I do have two communications this evening um, that will um, be referred to Public Works Committee for advertising. I have a grant of location for Mass Electric on Wabin Road and a grant of location, Mass Electric Verizon on Woodcliffe Road. Thank you. So those will be referred to Public Works. Next, we have unfinished business and proceeding meeting. <coughs> seeing none, reports of committees. And seeing none, moving on. Presentation of petitions, memorials, and remonstrances. Council Pearl. Thank you, uh, Madam President. It is with uh, deep sadness that I report the passing of Arlene Maddy. From the Maddy family, many folks probably know, uh, Quincy, big Quincy Point family. Um, she had been in Quincy pretty much her entire life leaves behind uh, many grandchildren and also her daughter Mary Beth who still lives in the point and uh, her son Robert who actually lives uh, in Squanum. So if we could just keep the Maddie family in our prayers, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Madam President. Anyone else? Any other petitions of, uh, I'm sorry, presentations of petitions, memorials and remonstrances? No? Okay. Motions, orders and resolutions? Seeing none, scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings. Council Harris. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, I'd like to schedule on March 9th uh, at 7.20 a public hearing, 2020-041 utility grant location, Mass Electric, Wabin Road. Thank you, Council. That's the, um, I'm sorry, Monday, March 3rd, before the next council meeting, right? March, March 3rd, 9th. got it. March Perfect. 9th, I'm sorry. And Thank also you. at 725 public hearing, um, um, 202041 grant location, Mass Electric, Verizon, Woodcliffe Road. Perfect. And that's also on March 3rd, correct? Uh, March 9th. 9th? March 9th, yep. Oh, it's 9th, okay. Keep reading the third. Thank you. Any other scheduling of committees? No? Okay, just quick, uh, before there's a quick motion to adjourn, I just wish, want to wish everyone um, a really, really happy Lunar New Year. I wish you all good health, prosperity, all the fun things that uh, the majority of you have heard over the last weekend and this past week of celebrations. Council Harris, I want to thank you uh, for creating an incredible stamp to honor the Lunar New Year this year for all of us. And so, um, yeah, to all of you, enjoy the remainder of the new year. And um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Excellent. Thank you.